Good evening, everybody. I think we can call the meeting to order at 6.03 with um, select member, Mr. O'Leary, select member um, Schultz, select member Gonzalez, and select member Walner. Present. Present. Is, is Mr. Walner with us? He's connecting. I see a smiling face. Yes. Okay. <laughs> perfect. All right. Well, Rich was just standing on his head. <laughs> I thought I saw him there. All right. I try to impress. There you go. Okay. Good. All right. I'm easily okay. impressed. <laughs> my, I'm gonna. I'm using my phone right now. I'm gonna try to. Uh, I'm gonna try to. My computer just decided to pop out on me. I'm going to try to... I'm going to right now. I'm going to try to... All right. I'm going to try to... All right. Why don't we start, as we normally do, with the announcement that this is being broadcast for us by MATV. And... We're on a remote meeting call, and why don't we recite the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, divisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Welcome, folks. I'm, I'm trying to look at my packet while I'm doing this. Where I'm running into interest and difficulty. So, so I think our... Um, First order of business is what I'm looking for. I'm sorry. Give me a second, folks. All right, so this, this meeting also we, we have on the agenda for the meeting. It's a Zoom call, a remote Zoom call, and that um, we're host, hosting this meeting pursuant to Governor Baker's orders and uh, uh, making it accessible to the members of the public by the published internet and phone connections and via NORCAM, NORCAM's broadcast. Did I say MATV? That's for my other job. NORCAM is a broadcast, <laughs> and I'm sorry, folks. Um, and so uh, the, the uh, first order of business is board member report. So let's, how about if we start with you, Mr. Um, nothing other than I just want to comment on um, oh, oh, for, first of all, I, I guess we'll talk about it later in relation to our, uh, our discussions with the DEP or the FEIR, as well as the uh, emergency uh, declaration in relation to the uh, water quality issue. And I'm sure the town administrator will address that later on. So that's ongoing and a lot of discussion taking place in regard to that. But uh, first and foremost, I just want to, first of all, thank the administration for keeping everybody well informed here in the community. Uh, you've been doing a terrific job, Michael. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for our first responders, uh, you know, fire department, police department. Um, you know, they're doing a terrific job. I just have uh, been assured by the administration that they have uh, adequate uh, protective gear uh, available to them for the foreseeable future, which to me is heartening. Uh, you know, for myself and, you know, Mrs. Gonzalez, you know, we have first responders in our family, and uh, we deem it extremely critical. You know that these people are protected and taken care of it it appears as though we've been able to to take care of that and i'm i'm grateful for that um again for everybody in the public um you know thank you for your participation and you know standing pat and uh, keeping a distance and uh doing everything you can to ensure that, that the uh, pandemic doesn't spread here in our community uh, i'm afraid it's going to be a long haul uh, but again, we're in it together. Uh, I just see in my own neighborhood people out, you know, out for a walk, uh, conversing at a safe distance, but uh, re-engaging families uh, with their toddlers and their teenagers, uh, engaging in activities that I haven't seen since I was a kid. And to me, that's somewhat heartening. And I said, there is some good coming out of this here. We're getting back to basics and getting back to ensuring that, uh, you know, everybody is. Uh, reacting as a community uh, it's, it's very heartening you know for those uh, who are uh, you know a, a supermarket employee, they come more to the forefront 
you know, people at the supermarket, you know, the people who deliver the mail, the people who are uh, you know, delivering some of our services here that we normally take for granted are really coming to the forefront. They are the heroes in the front line here. And we are really grateful. And, uh, and it really is taking, I know myself, so you have to rethink about what you're going to be doing and how you're going to do it. So it's... Uh, Everybody's participating. Everybody's doing the right thing, I hope, and uh, I hope everybody remains safe. But again, to the town administrator and the administration, our town employees, you know, I'm extremely grateful for what's being done. And I know we have a lot of our employees working remotely to ensure that the public's being well serviced and, uh, and they're doing a great job. So thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Um, Mr. Gilberto, we're getting a lot of feedback. We've heard a lot of that. We also heard a lot of feedback. For those members joining us remotely, can, Mr. Gilberto, can you mute? Can you mute the participants? And if people could use the raise hand function, if there is something that. For those members joining us remotely, Mr. Gilberto, can you mute that would be helpful so that we can actually hear what people are saying thank you and um mr walner mr walner yes hi everybody i just unmuted myself and again i'm using my phone so i apologize for lack of audio and video clarity if i get my computer going i'll switch over um anyways just two things um it was really you know steve what steve said is spot on um, it was really delightful to see the in this this together 01864 come together. Um, you know, Kim Manzelli, uh, Jen Ford, uh, Pastor Rachel from the Alders Gate all came together to create a you know a urgent line um, volunteer effort. And uh, Kim told me they had over 102 volunteers ready to help anybody who's impacted in any way by COVID-19. So um, it's just great to see this community outreach, you know, just in a very um, organic way come together. So I'm very delighted with that. And um, uh, you might have seen uh, my wife, Joyce, put together the, uh, the Sweet Caroline sing-along. <laughs> and uh, we did it again yesterday, and we had a great outpouring. We're doing it two more weeks um, uh, next Sunday and the following Sunday at 6 o'clock. So just go to the North Reading Community Connection and uh, uh, join on board with everybody who's getting outside and just at least singing together, which is a nice thing to do. That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Walner. Uh, Mr. Schultz. I just unmuted myself. Um, got a bunch of stuff. First of all, I want to say thank you to Gabrielle Brennan. Uh, she organized the Animal Safari that actually uh, Channel 25 did a news story on. What that was was everybody put stuffed animals in the front of their yards, and the kids rode around the neighborhood on Saturday, and they um, basically pointed out the animals. It got the kids out of the house. They were able to, at a social distance, uh, get out and have some fun with their families. Um, she also want to thank her mom, uh, Janet Vinci, Miss Reynolds, Room 10 moms, our town administrator, chief of police, Nancy, Lynn, and Maria at the North Reading Parks and Recreation Department, uh, Lena Giordano, all the elementary school PTOs, the Union Congregational Church, and Aldersgate Methodist Church, and Maureen Doherty, and the Clinton Memorial Library folks as well. They all helped spread the word, and it was a great event. Secondarily, we had two former board members that did yeoman's duty this weekend. Uh, former member Michael Prisco drove the Easter Bunny around town for two days. And I don't know how he did it, but former member Sean Delaney actually got the Easter Bunny to come to North Reading. And they drove around town and saw about a million kids with the Easter Bunny, and they would just drive by. The Easter Bunny was like in the back of Mr. Prisco's truck, and it was all social distance. The kids were waving. It was a great event, and it was really something that uh, I don't know how they got the Easter Bunny to come here, but it was really great that Sean did, and the Easter Bunny came and, and gave a lot of joy. A couple of things for the business community. Um, for business owners out there, there's a payroll protection plan loan that is available now to small businesses. You want to go through your local bank, and there's a way you can get it. And if you use it for payroll, utilities, and other expenses, rent, it is forgiven by the federal government. It's going to be one of those things that when it runs out, it runs out. So I would apply now. You go to your local bank for that if you're a small business owner. And lastly, I got uh, Mr. Vinny Rigucci uh, let me know that the Reading Municipal Light Department is offering virtual home energy audits at no cost. Um, I will put a, a blurb on Facebook about that at where you go to, but you can get your house audited uh, virtually where you don't have somebody come into your house and you can save on your energy bills. And that's all for me. Thanks, Mr. Schultz. Mrs. Gonzalez? 
Michael, I think you have to unmute. Uh, Mr. Gilberto, I think you have to unmute. Mrs. Gonzalez. Can you hear me? Oh, hey. there you are. We can Hi. hear and see you now. <laughs> Um, so Mr. Schultz stole a little of my steam there about Gabrielle. Um, uh, there's one thing more I wanted to touch on that um, is the fact that she reached out to Mr. Schultz and I first before she went ahead with this, which was fantastic, so that we could get the okay um, from Mr. Gilberto and the police chief. And um, she really did it really well. And it was a great, great thing. It was fun to watch Facebook and see everybody enjoying that. Um, and I'd also just like to shout out to uh, Peter Acola, if I'm saying that right, who is a DJ and drove around town also on Sunday with his whole setup with music and um, had it on live on Facebook and um, I know I had it on and it was really, really fun to watch and see and everybody was enjoying it and getting out there dancing in their driveways and yeah, just uh, can't say enough about this town and how we all just make the best of whatever we're going through. It was fantastic. That is all. Thank you. And that, not to be redundant, but I, I want to thank everybody that all of my colleagues have thanked as well, because as Mr. Walner says, it's interesting to see how people are coming together in these organic ways. We're having parades for birthday parties that everyone's participating in and in different ways to commemorate uh, different different ways to commemorate things socially when we're supposed to be social distancing from one another and the bears we had bears all over the neighborhood bears in trees bears having tea parties on their front lawns it was a lot of fun not just for the kids but for the rest of us too and um and to also note i think mr um Mr. Gilberto um, will probably discuss this in a little bit more detail in his report. Um, but we did have, we did suffer a death due to COVID-19. So we want to keep that, keep that family and those, uh, those individuals in our, in our thoughts and prayers as well. And just to keep keeping up with the containment measures, the social distancing, trying to stay at home. Um, there was a suggestion, though it's not mandatory to wear face masks. And there's all kinds of tutorials about all different household items that you can make a face mask out of from, you know, something more sim as simple as a bandana and elastics. And just trying to keep everyone safe. And, you know, Mr. O'Leary mentioned this again, but if you have to call the first responders, let them know that you're experiencing symptoms. And I think the first responders in our community have been fabulous about posting to people, here's what you can expect to see if we come to your house. Here's what you can expect to see if we're on a call. So that, that outreach has been tremendous as well. And that's it. And with that, if we're all done, if everyone's all set and I don't see any hands up, we can move on to public comment. I guess we can do public comment today. <laughs> do we see hands raised for public comment? Anyone joining us that would like to make any comment? I see none. And so we're going to move on to, I'm going to ask the members to skip over minutes. I wanted to add some things in to the minutes that we're, we're reviewing. And due to the fact that we've kind of been working around the clock on all the emergency orders and new legislation, I didn't get to call Jane on it. So, but I will be preparing to do so. So with that, I'd like to actually go to number five, which is the COVID-19 update that Mr. Gilberto will be providing us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first for the board members, there's a, a revised agenda that is in your, um, in the share file folder. I just want to point it out. What's been um, modified to the agenda is this evening. First is relative to the vote on the administrative consent order. And then uh, secondly, we've added in language that would allow the board to take action related to um, taxes that are due and fees that are due during this emergency as well, because we believe it's timely. 
Um, so, Madam Chair, I know we didn't get to, to connect, but I thought you would be supportive of having it on the agenda so we could take action quickly. Um, so we'll talk more about those agenda items when we get to those items. Um, with regard to um, where things stand in the COVID-19 response, um, as we released on April 3rd, um, we have um, experienced the first COVID-19 related death of a North Reading resident. Um, the deceased resident met the criteria for a higher risk of severe illness as defined by the Centers for Disease Control. Um, our thoughts and our prayers are with the family of the deceased. And as I said on Friday, out of respect for the family, uh, no, for, no further information is going to be released by the town. Um, but we certainly keep that person um, and their family and all of the folks who are um, experiencing helping care for responding to emergencies associated with this emergent, uh, with uh, this COVID-19 illness in our thoughts and in our prayers. Um, where we stand as of today in terms of the, the volume, um, we have uh, a total of 30 confirmed cases, excuse me, as of Friday, we'll be updating that number on Tuesday, tomorrow. But as of Friday, we had 30 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in North Reading. We had seven cases that have recovered at that time. And then we were continuing to monitor with tw the uh, remaining 22 cases with one case having um, been deceased. Um, a couple of updates that I just want to provide with regard to our municipal facilities. The first is that there are only three park facilities that are open at this point, just to be clear for everybody. One is only the walking paths at Ipswich River Park, um, only the walking track at Arthur Kenny Field, and then the walking trails or hiking trails at Eisenhower Pond Park. The remainder of the Parks and Recreation and School Department recreational facilities and fields are all closed at this point in time. And most, if not all, have been marked um, with other steps being taken to um, discourage usage. And we ask the public, um, including families and the parents of our youth in our community, to be mindful of the social distancing um, requirements that we're all trying to follow. Um, you know, that includes you know, the group that you go to the park with and also the group that you end up inadvertently running into when you're there as well. We, we ask everyone to be respectful of that um, so that we can keep the parks open and continue to allow the public to be able to get some exercise in those, um, in those facilities. Um, with regard to some um, newer developments, um, this evening the Board of Health met to take up action providing more guidance to the retail stores that are open with regard to occupancy. And this is something that a lot of retailers are taking on their own to do, but here in North Reading, to, to be clear, we set the expectation fairly for all of our businesses. Um, there's an order that they've approved just this evening that would cap the number of customers at the larger stores in order to enhance the social distancing expectations. And for the public, these stores are already taking a number of steps and I'm sure the board members have seen in the stores what they've done, including marking the floors off, um, and staff that's wearing masks, depending upon um, the store. Um, the shields that have been put up at the checkout at the, uh, at the supermarkets as well. Some of the smaller stores have installed shields. So that's all been done, a combination of proactive work on the part of businesses, um, as well as with either um, friendly or informal or formal feedback from the Board of Health as well, all intended to keep these resources open for our residents during this emergency. Um, we are encouraging the restaurants that are open to, to the greatest extent possible to move to delivery or curbside pickup. We know that's not a possibility for all establishments, but where it is, we're asking them to do so. And a number have done that voluntarily already. So I mean, we've seen very good cooperation from the businesses here in town. And then the final thing that I wanted to note here in the meeting this evening um, with regard to the, the COVID-19 response itself is that we have received some feedback relative to um, religious communities here in town that are looking to have gatherings. And um, there's, there's a lot of really well-intended folks that are really trying to find any opportunity opportunity to bring people together so that they're able to be in close proximity to others and to celebrate religious services, particularly with uh, the holidays that are upcoming. Um, but, you know, we've had some discussion in the town hall with the public safety director and the health director, and it just, it, it appears that there's really so many logistical challenges for us to actually make those types of gatherings work. And, and you, what we've been hearing is, you know, a parking lot service with everybody in their cars. And that's really, um, really something that appears to be inconsistent with the directive of the governor that's out there. And we've had a lot of good, you know, back and forth conversations with folks. 
The Board of Health is going to further discuss this at their meeting on Thursday, but we're, we're expecting that an order would be adopted by the board that would make clear that 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 type of uh, gathering is not consistent with the governor's order. And so I more wanted to put that out there so people are not caught off guard with it. Um, you know, I know that a couple of communities have approached us. It, it's been some conversation and I appreciate their, their interest. But um, in the end, it, it would appear that the language that allows for the gatherings in, park and, in parking lots is more directed at the transit nature of pulling into the parking lot, parking your car, getting out and going into a store. Um, so. I'm going to stop there. I, mean, I probably could talk for a lot longer on a number of things, but I just wanted to provide that as the most recent updates with more numbers relative to the incidence of COVID-19 being released tomorrow. I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't see any hands raised, but just a comment to that is that I don't know that we could as a community or a town make any assurances of safety of individuals who are attending those type of events, even with, you know, those types of measures in place with all of those people congregating in one location. I would find it very difficult for us to be able to say yes to that, knowing that the, it's transmitted very easily it, through the air or, you know, through close proximity, probably even, you know, at a six foot distance if someone's infected. So I don't know how we would be even able to do that. That's just a thought in terms of people congregating. And I know people are doing that. And I know people are not, not necessarily congregating in large numbers that a probably a religious gathering would invite, but, you know, people are, you know, meeting each other and tailgating and staying distances away from each other in their own vehicles. But I don't know that we can sanction it and say, sure, use our park to, to do that without saying we can't assure you safety if you do. I don't know if you've given any thought to that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, it's, it's really a challenge for us to try to, to figure out how we main, maintain that. And, and I think you know, look, we're, we're doing, we're doing, and, you know, and have been supporting things that we would not normally be supporting in these times that we find ourselves in and trying to foster our community. Um, you know, we, 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 and it's been great that you know people have been coming forward to ask, Hey, does this fit within the mission? I mean, that's fantastic. The groups that organized the events this past weekend, the, the groups, even the churches that are looking to move forward, you know, approaching us to bring, begin that conversation, but the logistical challenges are just, they're, they're too extensive. And, you know, the idea of the windows are up is fine until it's 80 degrees and you can't keep the windows up or somebody has to use the facilities and there are no facilities. It just is very, very challenging for us. Um, and, you know, we, we want to we want to support the effort that everyone is making to maintain the community uh, and the strength of our community here. But, you know, the, the request we've gotten is just one that we're not we're not able to, to, to endorse because we can't guarantee everybody's safety. Okay. I have a hand. Steve, Mr. O'Leary. I see Mr. O'Leary. Just as, um, first of all, again, I, I think you know, the administration teams seems to be taking a very prudent approach to things. And I think is uh, commenting in relation to the governor's efforts. Um, I think he's been doing a terrific job. And kudos to him and staying ahead of the curve and uh, fighting the, uh, the federal government for for supplies and partnering with private industry like the uh, like the crafts to to get our first responders the the needed uh, personal protection equipment that they need. But my question to the administration is that what about um, someone contacted me in relation to the construction ongoing construction projects and things of that nature? Have we taken any action yet, or is everything still status quo? And so long as the construction companies maintain adequate distancing. The expectation at this point is that the, the, that they will maintain social distancing. Much of the construction here in town is in line with um, the governor's allowance that, that housing related construction continue. Um, you know, so we're, we're trying to do our part to maintain our support for that. Um, when we're at the job site, you know, providing that feedback, it does disrupt things, but we are doing things a little bit outside the box. And we have had some situations of a recorded video inspection taking place. A contractor shows us what they've done with a 
you know, with, with a video that they've taken. And uh, depending upon whether it's sufficient or not, we're relying on that information. So and we're trying to do our part to keep that that part, which is a big part of our economy, moving um, here. And so far, it would appears that we're, we're able to, but we're obviously monitoring the guidance at the state level that, that's coming out. Um, one thing I will state is that we are procuring additional assistance for the set for the, um, the the board of health to help with septic and systems while the director's tied up with uh, with this because um, we don't we don't want to become the delay any more than we have to be. Very good, thank you, Mr. Schultz. Michael, could, I know some of the other uh, neighboring towns on the big box stores have gone to one way aisles such as like something like Walmart stop and shop. Is that something we're gonna explore here in North Reading? It's something that we, that there was some conversation about today, uh, Mr. Schultz, but I, I think the challenge that we have is, you know, from a logistical standpoint, how we manage that and, and, and how much more is it going to to bog down what's taking place in, in, the, in the stores from what's already restricted them. I, I think the Board of Health really felt that we could get our arms around the number of people that are in the buildings, we could get some better control. That being said, a number of places have done it voluntarily already. Um, Stop and Shop being the prime example of it. Yeah, lowering the numbers should alleviate some of those problems. That's true. I think that, that that's our, our, our feeling. Um, you know, and again, I, I can't stress enough, we've had quite a bit of cooperation. I mean, people are, are we're working together to try to solve these problems, of which are, are new to us. Thank you. Okay, many members have any questions. Mr. Walner, any, any questions or thoughts? We good. No, Miss Mrs. Gonzalez. No. All set. Okay. I just want to make sure I ask each of you because I no, don't necessarily know if you are doing the raise hand functions. So I want to pay attention to that. I can see some of you wave at me too. But <laughs> hey, where, right, is, so. where is the raise hand function on here? So if you look at the bottom to the right, if you're looking at your meeting with participants. It'll give you a, a listing of all the participants to the right. So on the bottom icons, do you see participants? Yeah. If you, if you click that, it'll show you all the, that's what I'm following. And I got I, you. And so on the bottom, it's mute and raise hand. Okay, now I see it. Thank you. All right. I mean, but I can see you waving to me, so I'll, I'll try to pay attention to that, yes. All right, so our next order of business is a is uh, on the agenda is consider to postpone the annual town election of May 5th, 2020, as provided for under Chapter 45 of the Act of 2020. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, thank you. And with us this evening is the town clerk um, who submitted, um, she submitted a recommendation um, for the select board to consider both with regard to the date of the election as well as the hours of, of the election. Uh, and with your permission, I'd like to ask the town clerk if she would like to make a presentation on her own. And I'm going to unmute you, Barbara. Barbara, are you there? I do know she was call calling in, but I can't hear the uh, the audio. Should we, shall we? Do we want to discuss that, or do we want to come back to it when she can join us? Um, I mean, we could discuss it. I mean, her recommendation, as you saw in there, was that the election be moved to June twenty third, twenty twenty. Um, you know, so that's one action that the board uh, would be able to take at this point. And I believe she said in her communication that if you didn't take that decision this evening, the latest that you could do it would be um, your next scheduled meeting of April 13th. Um, although I would tell you, depending upon you know what what's left for action and where we stand at the end of this evening, we may or may not wish to have that meeting on the 13th. You know, depending upon when what what deadlines we're working up against. It all I think that'll all reveal itself throughout this evening. I'm going to try again. Oh, I see Barbara has her hand raised. I <laughs> see that too. Barbara, you there? Stay with me. Liz, are you able to reach uh, Barbara directly? I think she has herself muted. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's, it looks like. Uh, what number is she? <laughs> It's, it looks like iPad, so perhaps she doesn't have the ability to communicate to us through the iPad right now. Um, 
there were, I, I know on this topic, there's been a lot of sort of discussion about, you know, um, drive by or absentee voting or um, the, you know, thought of electronically voting, but really the law has remained in place and with the exception of permitting us to extend the deadline and just for um, the all of the regular election requirements of having an in-person public location for casting a ballot and, you know, public location for counting the ballots and those types of things that that has not changed at all. So in that we're needing some time to um, continue containment measures and there's emergency orders in place, it would be very difficult to hold public election right now with people gathering and, you know, people coming to vote. Even as little as people tend to show up for our local elections, it still, we still have to accommodate voting in person in a public place. So, um, Mike, Mr. Gilbert, were we able to get Barbara to call in? I've asked the finance director see if she can reach her directly to to bring her in. I mean, I don't know if you want to you know, move a couple of items down. Well, I see. If, I see Mr. Schultz's hand is. I can see her hand is raised, <laughs> but she may need a she may need a headphone to connect to her iPad that has a microphone on it so we can hear her. Um, well, Madam Chair, just because I realized I didn't say it, in addition to the recording that NORCAM is doing, I am recording this through the Zoom function as well. I don't know whether I'm supposed to disclose that or not, but it is being recorded through that as well. <laughs> sure, that's great. And and it's a, an excellent function for us to keep accuracy and also to show all of these little you know, bumps in the road that we experience because remote meetings are new to all of us. So, um, uh, Mr. Schultz. Yeah, one of the things that concerns me as far as on this health and safety standpoint of the elections is, I mean, a lot of our election workers are retirees and of the age where they're at a higher risk for COVID-19. So I think we want to be very careful having them work together close with the public, and, you know, until we get a better handle on what's going on with the virus as a whole. And that's the first thing that jumped out. Of. I wish there was an avenue for doing it absentee or mail-in or what have you. It seems like there's no legislative option for that right now but i i am concerned about exposing you know an older staff to the potential of what's going on out there right now so that's one of the that's the first thing that came to my mind when i thought of our election workers so the the absentee ballot um doesn't go away because we're postponing it there'll still be an option for people that are you know qualified to obtain an absentee ballot can vote by absentee ballot but you're i mean you're right and it probably if she was capable of telling us this it still requires a team to assemble to open the absentee right. ballots and run those ballots through the machine and it's still going to require the regular election anyway so um, does anyone have any questions? Should we move forward with the vote on this? I think it's pretty self-explanatory. If anyone has any question, I think we should be able to take the vote. I think we all understand the basis for it. And I think it was clear, clear what date, what date um, the town clerk had asked us to postpone it to. So if there's no other comments, um, Mr. O'Leary, good. Uh, Mr. O'Leary's got a hand raised. Yeah, no, I just, uh, I, I wish Barbara was available to, to answer some questions. I just, uh, you know, I'm just curious as to what the minimum crew amount is required based upon, first of all, you have non-contested races. Uh, we have a hard enough time attracting people to, uh, to participate when we have contested races, never mind uncontested races. So we have uncontested races here. Uh, you know, could we consolidate it all into, well, there's four precincts, you know, smaller crew. Um, and again, with this early voting by mail uh, opportunity where they can use the absentee ballots, you know, people, anybody can request rather than just an absentee, but an early voting ballot uh, without giving a reason just because I don't want to participate, you know, I'm going to be away or have to give the reasons for the absentee ballots. You know, it certainly opens up an opportunity uh, I think, first of all, to try all this out. We've done the early voting where people can go into town hall and vote early, but this early voting by mail uh, is something that's a thing of the future and we should be taking advantage of anyway. 
but my, my biggest question is, um, you know, really, how many people have we, do, do we think we're going to need for this type of an election with as uncontested races? You know, what's our participation level? My, my guess is it'd just be probably less than 500 would be actually going, going to the polls, you know, so there's not going to be a crowd of people. You know, what will we really need for uh, a crew uh, to handle that type of uh, activity? How can we protect the workers that are there adequately? You know, can we or can we not? And, you know, let's just get it over with. This one here is a uh, an easy one because there are no contested races, you know, unless someone's going to mount a, a last minute write-in campaign, you know, good luck to them. Uh, the participation level is going to be abysmal, you know, it'll be less than probably 1% or 2%. So uh, I wish Barbara was available just to I think she's here know what the, what the minimum requirement would be based on her estimation as to what the participation level is going to be. And can we accommodate that? Okay, I see more hands raised. And Mr. Gavardo was was uh, the town clerk able to call in so she I think, can? I think I see her number on there now, Barbara. She she asked if we could wait for her. She is trying. She's having some technical difficulties. Can she call us? Just yes, her number is up. her number is listed there, I believe. Okay. Um, so. I, I'm in oh, contact with her, so she's just asking us if we can, you know, course, wait or we can course. back to it. And Steve, I, I think your hand is still raised as well. Did you have anything, other questions on that that you wanted to, Barbara to answer? No, it's easy to keep my hand raised, you know, virtually as opposed to up in the air like this because it doesn't get tired. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot to put okay. it down. <laughs> All right. And so are you, are you, um, I, I know we're, we haven't talked about how we're anticipating voting, but are you opposed, in other words, to postponing the election? Um, I'm interested to find out if we think of the, the you know, Barbara thinks, I, I know that what a recommendation is here, but I'm just curious as to, again, what would be the minimum number of people required based upon the current situations? What does she anticipate she would need, you know, before we go and postpone it? Um, you know, to be, because the outcome is, is, is not in question. It's just a, a question of being, uh, making people available, keeping them safe at the same time. And, um, you know, what, what's our expected level? And can we, if we were to keep it on the same date, still limit the hours that she's suggesting, which is just 12 to six, you know, six hours, um, you know, for my guess is less than a hundred people an hour. Um, would be participating and again people could still participate by mail and again i think this is a good exercise for people getting used to what uh, what the future is going to be in relation to uh, how elections are going to be conducted so, be, so before I, I cast the vote i would like to hear from her if possible barbara any luck Well, why don't we move on and try to get to other business while we wait for her to call in? Um, uh, so that was actually items. It's actually items six and seven that we've been discussing. So let's move on to item eight, which is the May 11th, 2020 special town meeting for Seven Acres Poultry Farm and up, update with regard to that matter. Madam Chair, through you, so in, in the revised agenda, we actually added the consideration of um, last week's municipal relief bill, and it looks like she just got stepped away, but the finance director I know is, is here to speak to it. Um, what I'll do is just start offering a quick summary of what it would do, um, what the bill would do, although unless you'd like to offer, you probably have a better understanding of it than I do. <laughs> Well, the, the, definitely the legislation was implemented or signed into law on Friday, um, late Friday, I think. So it does offer us um, a tolling of that deadline and an additional time once the emergency is lifted within which to hold that the election. And so that gives us a little bit of breathing room, which is 90 days under 61A. That's correct. Right? Yes, with regard to... Uh... 
with regard to the um, the, the 61A property, it's the duration of the public health emergency plus 90 days. So uh, that emergency started on March 10th and um, it is still still running, obviously, plus 90 days. Uh, there was a, a there were a couple of other provisions in that bill that's now law that allow for the chief executive officer of a city or town, or in our case, it would be the select board here in the town of North Reading to take action to provide a bit of relief um, on the timelines and some of the penalties associated with um, taxes and other assessments. So I've spoken with the finance director uh, on Friday when this became law. And then um, again today, and I, you know, I don't want to speak for her, but I believe she feels that the, 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 the actions that are allowable under the, uh, the law are um, prudent ones that we would recommend to the board and that we believe we could um, support and absorb the impact of, um, at least at this stage. Um, so, um, you know, I'll ask Liz, if you, would you just offer sort of a quick summary of what the, what the, the options are and then um, your, you know, your position as, as to our ability to absorb them? Yes. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, so the town administrator and I spoke on Friday um, in regards to this, and I also spoke with the town treasurer. We um, have been, town treasurer collector, I should say, um, we have been receiving multiple uh, phone calls um, a day asking if there's going to be extensions to um, due dates on real estate taxes, motor vehicle excise, um, you know, water and trash. So um I feel that we can absorb, you know, the delay um, in payments. Um, you know, many people are still paying, but there are many people that um, are asking if there will be an extension. So I really feel that um, as a community, um, you know, enact this to help the, the residents. Hello? For the, Hello? For the, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. You know, to help the, okay, hello? so for the for the I'm not sure who that is, but for, for the for the for the members, um, the legislation essentially permits the the town to extend the deadline, which is currently May first, and and Liz, if you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but the current deadline of May first to to um, <coughs> June first will be the time frame to start the cal a calculation of interest. So it gives that thirty day breathing time frame and ex extends the payment. Um, it extends the. Um, there's also a provision that allows individuals to apply for, for statutory exemptions to June first. So it extends that deadline. If it's if it's you know up to the board to extend that, it also allows for the um, it allows us the ability or authorizes to waive the payment of interest and other penalties on payments that are made after three ten, which was the date of the declaration, which would which would if it was due be it was due before then and made after then and before June thirtieth, that we can um, if it's an excise or a tax payment or uh, water or sewer charge or water charge in our case, and it was a payment made, it allows us to waive a collection of interest or penalties on that payment provided that it's received by before June 30th under the legis under the legislation and um, it also uh, allows us to enact you know enact, it basically allows us to shift deadline dates and allows us to forego collection not of real estate taxes, but of you know interest and penalties that might be charged, might have been charged, and that those interest and penalties won't start to attach until after the extension date of June first. And I think that is a summary, um, Liz. That hopefully is accurate. And, yes, Kate, uh, I, I agree with with that summary. Um, it was very um, thorough, and that is you know what I understand to be true from the past legislation. Okay, so part of what Mr. Gilberto and the and the finance director are asking us to do is 
to consider implementing these and take taking action to implement these and in, in, uh, madam madam chair there are two items i'll point or three items i'll point folks to well, two for this agenda item. If you are in the share file folder for tonight's meeting, there is a, a, a separate file called 4-6-2020 motions number two. And that includes two motions for the two agenda items. Um, there's also a, uh, if anyone wants to read it, a summary of the legislation that's in there. Uh, it ends in the terms municipal relief legislation, but uh, the provisions that we're bringing forward to the board this evening are the ones that you and the financial officer have referenced. Um, and there are two separate votes that are in those motions that we have prepared. Um, Mrs. Gonzalez, I'm not sure if you have access to them or not, but if you look in the share file folder for tonight's meeting, there should be a separate file and it ends in, um, I think, motion um, two. Ends in what? No, it's it, the last, it, it should, um, the name is 4 6 2020 motion. Any members have any questions? Mr. O'Leary? Mr. Walner? Good. Mr. Walner, you're good? Yeah, just a quick question. Just for, just for Liz. I, I think what I'm hearing you say, Liz, is that it's, it's not a budget issue for us to extend this courtesy to the residents. I'm not sure. I've been doing start Just to confirm, please. I think that Barbara is trying to speak to uh, the uh, question, Rich. Hello? Hello? It's Barbara. Who's ever in control of the controls? Could you mute everybody again and then start over? Yeah. Right, so we're going to mute everybody here. So, All right. Ma Madam Clerk, we can hear you. We're about to take votes on another agenda item, and then we're going to go back to that agenda item and have you answer some questions on it. So hang tight for us. We're going to be taking votes on another agenda item at the moment. Hey, I don't think she's deaf. No, she can hear us. I can hear her. I can hear her. She she's called it. Okay, so Mr. Just Waller, again, Mr. Very, Waller had a question for for our finance director. So Liz, all I'm asking is what your what I think I heard you say at the very beginning was we can extend this courtesy to the residents in town. It's not a budget buzz buster in any way. Correct, uh, Mr. Wellner, that is correct. Um, so we, you know, we've looked at the finances and, you know, extending the, the due date um, to this, it's still within this fiscal year. So, um, you know, we will be okay. And about 85% of um, our real estate taxes come from mortgage companies. Um, so at this point, you know, there's no reason that they would pay, you know, past the due date of May 1st um, as it's collected through escrow for um, individuals. Um, so, you know, that's what uh, the Department of Revenue, you know, is telling communities as well that it's okay that, you know, as long as you feel that you'll meet your um, budget numbers that, it, you know, it's, it's something that we should do. Mrs. Gonzalez, any question? I want to know how he did that thumbs up. <laughs> he does it on the bottom. He has reactions on the bottom. <laughs> that is correct. If you go to the bottom right of your screen, there's reactions, and you can do the thumbs up or you can clap. He did that in our first meeting, and that's how I learned that. Yes. All right. Any other, uh, Mrs. Gonzalez, do you have any questions about it? No, I understand that. All right. And so, seeing no further hands raised, do I have a motion? Well, I do have the motion. Um, Madam Chair, I move pursuant to Section 10 of Chapter 53 of the Acts of 2020 to extend the due date of bills for taxes from May 1st, 2020 to June 1st, 2020 to extend the deadline for preliminary tax payments for real estate and personal property from May 2020 to June 1st, 2020 and to extend the deadline to apply for exemption for certain property taxes from April 1st, 2020 to June 1st, 2020. Okay, I, have a, I have a motion by Mrs. Gonzalez and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion or deliberation? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Schultz. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. And the chair votes aye. 
All right. Do you have a second motion, Mrs. Gonzalez? Well, which one is that? The, the next motion. Oh, okay, I get it. No, no, that's executive session. This should be um, this should be under that same file, right underneath the motion you just read. Another motion, sec referencing section. Oh, okay, I got it. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to pursuant to section 11 of chapter 53 of the acts of 2020 to waive the payment of interest and other penalty for late payment of any excise tax betterment assessment or appointment thereof water rate or other charge added to a tax for payments made after its respective due date but before june 30th 2020. Second. I have a motion by Mrs. Gonzalez and a second by Mr. O'Leary. And any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Mr. Walner? Aye. Mr. Schultz? Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez? Aye. And the chair votes aye, and both motions pass unanimously. All right. Now we're going to return to Mrs. Um, Stats, our town clerk, to discuss agenda items six and seven. All right, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Hallelujah. <laughs> three, three devices, and I finally got through. Is it on your regular telephone, your good old fashioned telephone? <laughs> I tried that too. So All right. This is crazy. All right. So, I, I did hear part of the discussion starting. Um, and uh, so, of course, it's because of the virus that we want to consider postponing the election. The uh, special act by the legislature does allow communities with a, an election between, um, I think it was May 13th through May 30th, to postpone. And the only caveat is that it has to take place by June 30th. Um, you know, we just have to be concerned of our election workers and the voters. We don't know when this situation is going to perhaps get, get better. Um, so, it's it's just an uncertainty that we're facing right now. Um, a postponement would only change a voter registration deadline. It would not open up nomination papers for any additional candidates. The ballot is set right now. Um, any elected officials, and this would be Mr. Schultz, would continue to serve until a new person is elected and sworn in. The legislation does allow to use the existing voting equipment, which it means really the ballots as they are printed with the current election day. So there's no cost involved with reprinting ballots or anything like that. Um, I did hear Mr. Leary raise concerns about the turnout and I agree wholeheartedly that we're not looking at a big turnout for this election. Um, in the last couple of years for our town election, we have averaged less than 5%, but we still know that there would be exposure to both the election workers and any voters who were to come out and want to do in-person voting. The legislation does allow for absentee voting to be used for this. The, the COVID-19 um, situation would be considered uh, a reason to use absentee voting and they have enacted early voting by mail in order to assist with the process of trying to do as much remotely as far as voting goes. I don't know if there were any other questions on this. 
members have any questions? I don't see any hands raised. Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, yeah, Barbara, I was just thinking, you know, you were also suggesting that we limit the hours from uh, noon to six. Apparently yes. that's that's part of the legislation also that allows for a short number of hours. Actually, it's a state, it's a, it's its own state law that has always been an option, but in as with most communities, we have just run our elections with the same hours that state elections run. So that's a separate law. It has nothing to do with the new legislation, but it seemed like a good time to try to um, perhaps limit these hours and you have less exposure for everybody. Right. My, Especially my, considering the low turnout that we're anticipating. Right. Yeah. You know, like I said, you know, you, we're getting less than 5% here generally, even with contested yes. races. Um, you know, so I don't know what your anticipated level would be. Maybe it's 2%, but. You know, that being said, you know, you're talking 300, 400 people that may, may participate, but that right. how many people, and, if, and, with, with, with the shortened hours, um, how many people would you feel that you would need? Well, that's, we still have to run uh, supposedly a full complement of election workers for each shift. However, we can ask for waivers from the Secretary of State's office. In that regard, I would be, if we were shortening the hours, I would be looking at one election worker at the check-in table, one at the checkout table, one at the ballot box. We would not have people in the foyer at the information table. We, we would be limiting as many workers as possible. Right, so, so you're talking, you know, Four precincts. Can you combine the precincts? No, we cannot. So, so you because of the number least, of registered voters in each precinct. So you need at least three per precinct and, and a ward, Correct. I assume. You know, four warden and a clerk. Warden and a clerk. Okay. So that's three, that's five, five. people. I'm sorry. That's correct. Five people. Five people. So that's a total of 20 people. Correct. Yeah. And then uh, I, I, I assume that, uh, again, we, we don't know, you know how long this is gonna run, but I would assume that you would have some sort of, you know, people wearing gloves and masks um, available to them anyway, during that time period. Well, we certainly are going to try. Uh, we have to do something to protect them. And, but I will be depending on the Board of Health or someone else to be able to find those for us. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, to to me, you know, we, we're talking, I don't know, maybe three hundred people are going to be participating, and that probably includes the absentee ballots and the early voting, uh, which is the same ballot, I assume, mail-in ballots. It is. Um, so I, I guess my interest is, you know, how many people do we really do we need? Uh, the outcome is is pretty much predetermined because there's no contested races. Um, I mean, the opportunity always exists for write-ins, and that's, that's something we have to allow for, but it is highly unlikely that somebody would uh, have a campaign at this point that would be viable against a person printed on the ballot. Uh, I don't know that, um, I think Mrs. Uh, uh, Clerk stats is explained. I, I don't think she can reduce the number of individuals that are required to be there because That's what I was asking. Uh, anticipating a low turnout and there's still some, there's still requirements under election laws that have to be complied with. And Mrs. Gonzalez has her hand raised too. So we want to give everybody an opportunity to ask Mrs. Stats some questions. Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, I just uh, wanted to give my opinion that um, I just feel like it's a no-brainer to me to postpone this. I don't see that it's an issue at all. I think that we should take every precaution. Even one person getting sick going in to vote is one person too many, as far as I'm concerned. So um, I don't think there's any dire need to have the election now and and. I think it would be better to put it off. Um, and I just wanted to, I don't know if you guys see that there was somebody who wrote a question in. 
I can't see that. Um, I, and I, I would like I to also. To, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I do want to actually give every every one of the members an opportunity to ask some questions while um, Clerk Stats is here. But um, Clerk Stats, did you have anything else to say in regards to what Mrs. Gonzalez asked? Or yes, I would like to just say. Um, right now, the governor's emergency declaration goes up until May 4th, and that's only the day before our election. If it should get extended, we would be left uh, having to take some kind of em emergency action because the this vote has to be taken before the date of the election. Okay, and uh, Mrs. Gonzalez all set? Yeah, yeah. Mr. Schultz has his hand raised. Yeah, as someone whose term is ending, there's no one that wants the election to go on schedule more than I right now <laughs> in North Reading. However, I, I just, I can't in good conscience vote to have the election on the road that we cannot put these poll workers in any one any type of danger um as miss gonzalez just stated and i think very aptly put if even one person gets sick because of this it's just it's just not a good idea there's no reason why this can't be delayed until health you know the health professionals and the guidance we get from the state and the federal government tell us we can do these kind of things having an election right now goes against every type of advice we're giving businesses we're giving individuals we're giving everybody in the town advice but we're not going to follow it i just it makes no sense and believe me i want this election to go forward more than anybody but for selfish reasons i just don't think it's a good idea right now i would i, I feel like we would have blood on our hands if somebody got sick because we held an election that could have been delayed you know eight weeks that's just my opinion thank you mr schultz mr walner anything any questions good all set and i i i hold i wholeheartedly agree with you i don't think there's any sense of needing to have this in the midst of the crisis and knowing all the things that we're supposed to be doing to try to be an example and make sure that we are compliant with as many of the containment measures as, as possible. We already have our hands full. And I thank you, Clerk Stats, for um, taking a look at this. We're also basically uh, polarizing our employees to have to do things differently than they've done them systematically year after year after year after year after year because this is one of its kind, first of its kind crisis that we find ourselves in. So I also appreciate the fact that you are um, taking a look at this and giving us the options of what we can do and being mindful too of the deadlines that we have to be adhering to as well. So thank you, Clerk Stats. I see Mr. O'Leary's hand raised, Ms. Mr. Schultz's hand raised. Do you still have any? You're all you all set? And I see the finance director's hand raised too. Uh, Mr. O'Leary, you all set? No, I'm not all set. I just uh, oh. I just don't want my questions to be misconstrued. Uh, first of all, you know I, I think you know public safety and uh, our employees and poll workers' safety is, is is tantamount to what we should be doing here. Um, my basis of my question was. Um, really what are we going to need going forward whenever this election is going to be held as far as staffing levels and my next further question is you know should this state of emergency get pushed out even further does the legislation and i, and I apologize for not looking at it that closely uh, allow for i believe the legislation that it has to be held before june 30th so regardless, so regardless we're going to have to do it by june 30th anyway Unless there's any additional legislation, right, I think good. all of this is in flex because if there is another declaration of emergency, there would be no way we could hold an election. If there is another, yeah, right. I also want to stress that the election workers are definitely in the most vulnerable uh, category of persons who are susceptible to this virus Correct, yep. and whether whether it's them or they go home and they have a family member at home it's one of those things that is spreading so rapidly it's 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 a very uh fearful fearful situation was there anything in the legislation that would allow for uh the board of registrars to appoint emergency type workers uh, who may fall into a different category uh, looking forward. Yeah. 
that is always an opportunity if you don't have sufficient number of election workers. Right. So, so but again, people, they but, do have to be trained. No, I understand that. So my, my, my question, further question is, again, if, and these people have every right to be concerned, you know, if the, the heightened level of concern is to the point where they don't want to work the polls and we're short on people, there is a mechanism for the Board of Registrars to find other people to do it, correct? Yes, that is correct. All right, so are, are you anticipating um, formulating a list of 20, 25 people to fall back on between now and, and the election? Because again, we don't know what, what this is gonna bring over the next two to four weeks. Um, right. So I, I am considering different categories of people who might be available. Um, but at this point, I, I wanted to see what action we were going to take here tonight. Uh, definitely, if the election were going to go forward on May 5th, that would be a, a very real consideration. If the election is pushed off until maybe the end of June, then we may see the crisis diminish. Um, it's certainly not going to be a situation where the election workers do not want to work. It's whether or not they're able to. This, this is a very dedicated group of people and they really want to do their part and, and it rarely would just be whether the situation wouldn't allow it. I, I just want to make sure that, you know, Again, I, I have no problem with postponing the election at this particular point in time. I just want to make sure that we have other uh, mechanisms in place to, I mean, this is what, why I asked the question, how many people do you really need right. bare bones to, to work? And yeah. again, knowing, right. the, knowing the people that we have here who are a dedicated group of people who have been doing it for years, you know, I wouldn't blame them one bit for opting out. You know, I just want to Absolutely. make sure that we can we can move forward and is there a mechanism in place to do so? And if so, it's at your attention to start building that list now. All set, Mr. O'Leary. All set. Okay. Um, our finance director has her hand up. Uh, Ms. Roar? I just wanted to mention that there was a question in the um, Zoom chat for Barbara, and it says, how do people get access to absentee ballots? Do they have to go to the town clerk's office? So maybe Barbara can answer that for us. OK, we have uh, links on our website for downloadable applications. And there'll be more information up on the website once the decision of this board is made tonight. But the application links are there. People just need to fill them out. They have to physically sign it, whether it's for absentee voting or early voting by mail. And then they can either scan it to their email and email it to us. They can fax it to us or they can mail it to us. There is no in-person contact required. And there is no um, set starting date for mailing these out. As soon as they're available, we can mail them out. Unlike, you know, with regular early voting, there's a set time period. And the ballot is at the printer right now. Okay. Thank you. Mr. O'Leary. I just think it's important for people to understand. We got some uh, oh, guidance. I'm sorry, Mr. Schultz had his hand up. I apologize. M Mr. Schultz, we're trying to give everyone yeah. equal, equal discussion time here. Sure. One of the things that's a little bit disconcerting that I just heard was changing elect election officials in a, because there's a pandemic and one group may be more at risk than another. I think if there's a pandemic, we shouldn't be having an election. We shouldn't be substituting one group that has an average age of 70 for another group that may have an average age of 50. If there's a pandemic, there shouldn't be an election, period. We shouldn't be substituting one like town hall workers who may have an average age of less than the election workers. That's insane to me. I think if there's a pandemic, there should be no election, period. We should have an election when safely able to have one, not substitute one set of workers for another who may be of a lower risk group. I don't think that's fair to the people at town hall. I just want to go on the record with that right now. Okay. And, and that's why this has been brought forward, Mr. Schultz. I agree with you. No. But in the event that we run short of election workers, you know, we do have an alternative way of, of 
looking for additional people. Mr. Walner? I, I would just say, I think we're getting just a little ahead of ourselves. Um, I think the issue is we have control to push the election out. I, I see no reason not to push the election out. And if the state comes back in and says, you got to push it out further, all the towns are in the same boat. So I think this is, I think it's, you know, I, I know there's contingency plans, all the towns would be affected by the same thing. I don't think we have to overthink this at this point. I think it's just basically, are we going to push the uh, election date out? There's no consequence in our town to do that. I don't see any reason not to do that. So I think we'll just move on and get to our next issue. Okay, thank you. I, I will like to say that um, as of last week, there was a survey uh, done among the clerks and their number is about 70 communities who have pushed out their election dates already. Makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so do we have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, just, just a couple of clarification. One, first of all, um, I, maybe my comments were misconstrued by Mr. Schultz, but it wasn't to push anybody out. I was looking for the mechanism by which the Board of Registrars can backfill election workers. We, we selected the uh, election workers. We vote on that every year. The Board does and authorize the Board of Registrars with a specific uh, list of people. And sometimes if we can't use that, is there a mechanism? And the answer was yes, which is good, and that's hard. But uh, also as a clarification uh, for the clerk, we got some um, information from town council in relation to the early voting. And I know uh, the, the Madam Clerk said that there's an application online for absentee voting, but under the new legislation, apparently, uh, upon application, any voter through any form of written communication. So if someone were to write to the town clerk and said, I'm looking for an absentee ballot, rather than using the application. It's my understanding based upon town council's interpretation here and guidance that the clerk would then forward them an early voting ballot, which is an absentee. Yes, that's what the voting. clerk told us. No, no, she said that there's yes. a form online that has to be downloaded and filled out and mailed, but that isn't necessarily the only mechanism. Someone else could just- No, write that's it. true, Mr. O'Leary. Okay, I just want to make that clear. Get letters. The important thing is that the person give us their their address and sign, and that's where the application really shows what needs to be filled out. But yes, we do take letters. We take that uh, as long as it's signed. But once again, sometimes we get a letter from a couple, a married couple, and they're requesting ballots for both parties, and only one person signs that letter. We have to get back in touch with them, get the signature of the other party before we can send them a ballot. So the application is just a, a very forthright method that shows exactly what needs to be put on the form. Yeah, but I, I, any I get, form I, of community, yeah. yeah. I'm not disagreeing that the, that the application makes it simple and easy, you know, for the, the clerk's office to handle things. but. You would also accept, and I think people, and I think the, the press hopefully will, will acknowledge and, and put out there that any form of application in writing, you know, signed and dated and signed uh, in writing, uh, correct. Signed in writing and, and, and with, the, with the proper address will be honored. Yes, and we have always done so. Correct. Yeah. But what was said before was just that, you know, we have the application online downloaded. Not everybody's, you know, has them. That is at home in order to download the application and fill it out and all the rest. So I just think it's important for people to recognize that early voting is available, you know, just through a written application with the name and address and signed by the appropriate people. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Schultz, I see your hand up. Okay. Okay. I forgot to take it down. Okay. okay. Um, so do I have a motion, Mrs. Gonzalez? There is another uh, question. There is. Oh, I can't see any of the questions. I apologize. I there seems to be one more question, which reads, is there a secure online election option the town can look into? And Barbara, I ask your response on that first. Yes, there, there is no option for online voting. That there's no provision in the state law for that. So it's not a lo local option. 
Thank you, Madam Town Clerk. Okay. No other questions and hands raised. And do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move that pursuant to section one of chapter 45 of the acts of 2020 and because of the state of emergency declared by the governor pursuant to executive order 591 declaration of a state of emergency to respond to COVID-19 the municipal town election scheduled for May 5th 2020 is hereby postponed to Tuesday June 23rd 2020. Second. I have a motion by Mrs. Gonzalez and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Schultz. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, clerk stats. Thank you, Barbara. And are, are you going to uh, take any action on the second request on the polling hours? So the, <laughs> you want to give us a quick discussion on that one? I think you, I think Mr. O'Leary mentioned it earlier. Mr. Gilberto mentioned it earlier, but the request is made to um, shorten the hours, shorten the polling hours. Yes. And again, this is because of the virus. We don't know what the situation will be at that time. Uh, the state law provides for uh, that the town election be held for four hours minimum. It must start by noon and can end no later than 8 p.m. If we were to shorten them per my suggestion, which would be from noon till 6 p.m., then we would only have to use one shift of, of election workers. So right there, it cuts in half the exposure of any of our workers. I am not anticipating a great deal of people coming in to do in-person voting. We certainly will be promoting absentee and early voting by mail as much as possible for the protection of the work voters as much as for the workers. So uh, this is not a usual request, but these are unusual times. And I don't like to short, shortcut the voting process, but I think that for the purposes of public safety, um, it really is a reasonable request at this time considering this ballot, um, the potential for write-ins is pretty small and um, our historical turnout for such uncontested races is really under 5%. So just a quick follow-up to for you to explain and so as not to disenfranchise any individuals that might typically vote you know, be leaving their offices at six, finishing up their work day, coming later, getting their quarter of eight. Those individuals will still have the capability to vote by absentee ballot. And what is the last day someone can request an absentee ballot and what, and it has to be posted by what date? All right, so the last date a request can be made hasn't changed. It is noon the day before the election in this case so it would be monday june 22nd and uh that would go with for early voting ballots too and then they must be either postmarked by election day but have to be received by the close of the polls on election day whatever hour that is so if they are postmarked on election day but not received in our office until the day after, they will not count. But that is the way the practice is now. The state law is written and clear on that. Perfect, okay. Um, members have any questions? Just a, just a comment, you know, I just think there's gonna be adequate notification for the public to participate, you know, through the early voting and absentee voting follow, you know, prospect and 
you know, take advantage of it. And I think that 12 to six is reasonable given the current set of circumstances and, you know, the unknown. So I, I think it's a reasonable request. Uh, certainly I wouldn't be agreeing to make a habit of it, but uh, from a 12 to six, but you no, know, I think this is a, a reasonable request and makes some sense. And with adequate notification to the public, uh, anybody who wants to participate can. So I think it's a good idea. Mr. Wall, And that's why I was choosing to bring this forward this early because we can get as much notification out to the public as possible. Great. Mr. Walner, any I appreciate, comment? I appreciate your suggestions and I think it's a good one. Okay. Mr. Schultz, questions or comments? No, nothing further. Mrs. Gonzalez, questions or comments? Just wholeheartedly behind Barbara. I think okay. this is a good, a good thing to do. All right, and I, Mr. Kelleher has a hand raised. Yeah, my, my question is why not, if it's gonna be four hours, why not two to eight and just alleviate the problem of people working? Well, the polls must open by noon. Oh. That's okay. in the state law. And okay. I thought that by, even though we only have to have them open for four hours, by extending it to 6 p.m., it would allow some people who are still working to come after their work hours, hopefully. Okay, I forgot your, your comment that it had to open by noon. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see no other hands. And if there are no other comments. Okay, do I have a motion, Mrs. Gonzalez? Yes. Madam Chair, I move that in accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 54, Section 64, the polling hours for the Town of North Reading 2020 annual town election originally scheduled for May 5th, 2020, and which election has been postponed by vote of the North Reading Select Board on April 6, 2020 to June 23rd, 2020, as provided for under Chapter 45 of the Acts of 2020, shall be specified in the warrant for said annual town election to be held between the hours of 12 noon and 6 p.m. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Schultz. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Schultz. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Chair votes aye, and that motion unanimously passes. Thank you, Clerk Stats. Thank you all for your consideration of these. I appreciate your support. Thank you, Barbara. All right. So our next. Um, Our next order of business is to review the June town meeting articles and discuss the potential change of date for the June town meeting. And we will hear from Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, I believe we have an agenda item prior to that with regard to the May 11th uh, special town meeting and the Seven Acres Poultry Farm. Um, if you wouldn't mind, only because uh, you know, I think the two are related, in my opinion, or actually related. Um, would that be okay, Madam Chair? I skipped right over that, and I, I apologize. We did talk. We did start to discuss this. Okay, so let's move back. I apologize to the, to my colleagues to the agenda item number eight. And it is, Mr. Gilberto, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, as you mentioned, that municipal relief bill that was signed into law last Friday included an extension of that um, the statutory timeline associated with responding to a bona fide offer for the purchase of a 61A property, which in the case of North Reading relates uh, specifically to the seven acres poultry farm, which the board was properly notified of the sale, the proposed sale under a purchase and sale agreement in January of 2020. Uh, roughly 50 or so days into that 120 day timeline that we had to respond, um, the governor uh, issued a state of emergency declaration and based upon this legislation, um, the, the clock, so to speak, stopped at about 50 days on that date and will run will remain suspended through the duration of the emergency 
plus an additional 90 days. And so um, I've had some conversation with the town clerk. Um, I've also had some conversation with um, the moderator. Um, and I think that there's some very obvious concerns with regard to getting people together on May 11th and our ability to properly do so. And so what we're looking at from, from, I think from our initial standpoint would be to at least consider moving the May special town meeting to the evening of the June annual town meeting on Monday, June 8th. And that to me, that would be a, a, a prudent first step I think it still remains to be seen whether or not we can actually conduct business on Monday, June 8th in, in that form and in that format. Um, I, I think that's unclear. Because of another provision in that statutory uh, change that was approved on Friday, the moderator who already had the ability to delay a meeting up to 30 days can actually delay it an additional 30 days. Um, so if we were to if we were to move that town meeting to say June 8th, that special town meeting currently May 11th to June 8th, and then get coming up to that date, or even you know getting near the time of signing the warrant for that June town meeting date, if we were to choose to delay the June town meeting either now or at that time, we would have the ability for the moderator in consultation with the select board and public safety officials to similarly delay further that um, that special town meeting from June 8th to whatever date we wish to choose within 30 days. So I've talked you know, with the moderator about that. I've also brought it up with the broker um, for the uh, proposed transaction, make him aware of the change in the statute and of some of the options that might be out there, um, you know, certainly making him aware that uh, the select board ultimately would be making the determinations. Um, from my standpoint, you know, uh, a prudent step might be to um, seek input from the public safety officials and from um, the moderator as well about potentially postponing that special town meeting to the evening of the June town meeting. So, Madam Chair, so so that would be the special uh, special within the regular. Yes. Yes, uh, either within, right, immediately preceding or immediately after that. Um, Traditionally, another, that is we, we, we open the regular town meeting and then reconvene or convene a special town meeting like at 705. Correct. Right. Another we've option. Already, we've already signed war, the um, warrant for our regular, regular town meeting, right? No, not oh. for our June town meeting. We've all, oh, I'm, been, I'm sorry. It's okay. The, the warrant <laughs> opened and then closed on March 16th, and we are March 23rd. I can't keep the date straight. Um, and we re, we received a listing of articles. Um, and uh, you know, with regard to that, an, another thing that I've been exploring is the possibility of the board placing the warrant articles that are currently on the warrant of the special town meeting onto the June annual town meeting warrant. And so the, the primary consideration for doing that would be that we would not be subject to the quorum requirement that we are subject to under a special town meeting. Um, you know, I have had a conversation with town council um, this afternoon about that with regard to their opinion. Um, and they're not aware of anything that would prohibit that type of action taking place, um, particularly because the two articles on the warrant for the special town meeting were of the creation of the select board. They were not citizens petitions. They were not petitioned by anybody. They were actually placed by the select board in response to the, um, the notice of uh, intent to sell that we received on the property. So that, that's another component of this that we don't need to make a determination on this evening, but it is an option that is available to us. But in any scenario, we cannot simply cancel the special town meeting. It needs to be continued and adjourned. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Walner, I see your hand raised. Mr. Walder? Mr. Walder, I see your hand raised. Sorry, here we go. <laughs> Too many buttons to push. 
Um, no, the, the quick question I have is, I, I think it's great to put it all in one meeting. It's great meeting. to put it all in. Oh, I don't know what's oh, I don't know what's second. Um, anyway. Um, anyway. Let me just mute. Let me just mute my. No, the, the quick question I have is, I think it's great Again. to put it all in one Okay. I think we got it. Uh, sorry. Um, so, Michael, the big question I have is, I think it's great to combine them together. Uh, we'll have a, you know, more people attend. Uh, the big question is, will we have such a packed night that it will be just overwhelming? And I, I, I looked at it, I didn't think so. I didn't think there was anything so controversial on there that we couldn't get through the other things fairly quickly. But um, if we're going to have a collision of agendas, you know, that would be the only reason why I would say we'd have to keep them separate. That's my only question. So I think it's a great question. And my personal opinion is over the next few weeks, unfortunately, possibly even longer, um, a lot more is going to be revealed about what our financial standing is going to be at the June town meeting. But I, I do think that it's fair to assume that some of the more ambitious things and even perhaps the Warren articles, et cetera, that it's just going the capital investments as well. I, I think that it's likely that there's going to be some modifications with regard to that either way. But when you look at the list as it stood at the last meeting, I, I do think it was manageable for us, at least at this stage, to try to take on everything in a single evening, in, in my opinion. Um, but I would also note that we have the option to continue the meeting if we are not able to get through things. And we have done that as recently as two years ago, I believe. Yeah, that's true. That was necessary. I, I agree. It looked that way to me, but I just wanted to hear your opinion. Yeah, no, I, think it's, I think it's fair. I mean, look, I, I, you know, we don't know where things are going to land financially. Um, you know, there have been years when we have seen a very difficult operating budget, and sometimes that can bring out quite a bit of attendance, and, and I don't want to foreclose any you know, possibility. I think we're hopeful that, that that's not the case, and that we're all working towards making sure that that's not the case. But that, that's another thing that I think, you know, could be a possibility. But again, our option would be to continue the meeting into a second night if need be. I'm good. Thank you. Mr. O'Leary, you all set? No, I, my, my, I expect uh, I had some discussion with the uh, town administrator earlier today. You know, my concern is more from a, a legal standpoint where we have already uh, notified the, uh, the purchaser and the, and the seller of the property and the timelines associated with that and called a special town meeting. You know, my concern is uh, abandoning the special town meeting and incorporating it into the regular town meeting with warrant articles, you know, doesn't place us in harm's way. And I think there's adequate time to, to get those questions flushed out. So I just didn't want to put us in a, in a bad situation if we are precluding, and I know we have to have the special, have the special town meeting and adjourn it and put it off to the night of uh, the first night of, of the regular town meeting. Uh, I just, cautioning everybody that we should get a, a good solid opinion as to whether or not we can forego the special town meeting and have separate warrant articles in the regular town meeting and forego the the need for the 150 uh, quorum requirement i just don't want us to uh, to lose an opportunity here uh, because we misstepped and that that was the, the crux of my conversation with the town administrator i confident that he put it forth to town council and I'm sure they're looking at it. So I just want to make the other members of the board aware that, you know, there may be a timeline involved here that, that would require us to still have a special town meeting, even if it's within the regular town meeting. Not necessarily the timeline, but the requirement to hold a special town meeting, in other words. Well, yeah, but it yeah, makes so sense to have it. It, it makes sense to have it within the regular town meeting, you know, time wise. But again, and if that gets postponed, the regular town meeting gets postponed to the end of June, you know, then we run into the problem with the moderator being only postponed twice. So I just want to make sure that we move forward with uh, with good advice and, and look at the, uh, the ramifications of, of the actions which were forced upon us by timelines, you know, to take the action we previously, previously took to call for a special town meeting. So we may not be able to avoid that 150 quorum, and if we can, fine, but you know, I, I don't know that the legislation specifically addressed that because of the previous action that we have already taken. It just took the, the read of it in section nine is that it simply suspends the time um, for 90 days after 
the de the declaration of the emergency is is terminated. So it's just a basic basic suspension of that time to, within which we are required to act, including holding that holding a meet up special town meeting for that purpose. So. No, I, I understand. My concern is that we've already called for the special town meeting. So do we have to follow through with that mechanism or not? It is itself. So town administrator is addressing it with town council, and I'm sure we'll get a, a good answer. And uh, we can move forward. Yeah, I did get an initial opinion back, um, you know, but I, I do want to review it. And, um, you know, certainly we can try to just troubleshoot any of the uh, any of the issues. And, you know, I did, you know, make again, I did make Mr. Dimitri, the broker, aware that this was a possibility uh, you know, that a delay you know, was a possibility. And um, I think he appreciated at least you know, an update. And I told him I'd provide him a further update after this evening's meeting. You know, in, in terms of the next steps, my suggestion is that the you know, the, the health director, public safety director, and I consult with the moderator and perhaps invite him to attend or participate in our next meeting for that formal consultation relative to moving the date of the May town meeting to at least that June town meeting evening. We don't need to make a determination on the warrant articles at this point. That warrant is already signed for the special town meeting. It's just a matter of changing that date. So if the board members are amenable to that, then we'll come and give you a formal recommendation at the next meeting, which is scheduled for a week from this evening. Okay, so Mr. Walder, Mr. Walder, Mr. Schultz, did you have any questions or um, Mr. Schultz? I had to mute myself. No, no questions. Mrs. Gonzalez? No. Okay. And seeing no other hands raised, do I have a motion, Mrs. Gonzalez? No, no There should not be a motion with regard to this particular uh, act. Oh, I'm sorry. Only because, only because of the consultation with the moderator, but we'll bring that formally back for the board at the next meeting. Okay. I, I do want to just thank Representative Jones and Senator Tar. Senator Tar. I know that they provided information online. Um, you know, we we. we you know, we made them aware of the situation. They were aware of the situation, and, and you know this was an important tool for us. That you know, you know, we know that it has an impact to somebody on the on the from the private standpoint with regard to a transaction. But we also know that there's a public purpose in the law that recognizes the town's interest. And I think we all felt that we wanted to make sure that the town at least had the opportunity to um, to carry forward its interest if it does in fact wish to do so, which we'll find out at town meeting. So I, I just want to thank both of them. And Madam Chair, thank you as well for monitoring things on your end within the municipal attorneys. My pleasure. All right, so our seeing no other hand raise, we'll just move on to the next order of business, which is review of June town meeting articles and discuss the potential change of date for the June town meeting. Mr. Gilberto. Well, I put this on here. The listing remains unchanged at this point in time, um, you know, subject to obviously the, the issue we just spoke about to potential articles from that special town meeting. Um, you know, I, I, again, I just put out there that we have the election, we have moved the election to later in June by virtue of the board's vote. One concept that I, I've discussed with the town clerk would be the possibility of if we wanted to keep the sequencing in the order that it traditionally has happened, which is to have an election followed by a June town meeting, we would move the June town meeting to after the June 23rd date where the election occurs. You certainly are not required to do so, nor do you need to take any action this evening. But I did want to bring up, you know, you know that piece of, uh, of information relative to what the custom has been. Um, you know, I don't know the order in which Mr. O'Leary would know this answer. I don't know the order in which the two happened when we had the April town meetings, whether the election was after the, the town meeting or not. Um, but I just that was something that came to my, you know, to my attention. Um, that we may wish to also consider, in addition to the public health emergency and whether we're actually able to assemble on June 8th. Um, you do not need to make any determination on that this evening, um, something that we can certainly think about over the next week and talk further about on April 13th. In addition to the public health emergency and whether we're actually able to assemble on June 8th. You do not need to make any determination on that this evening, something that we can certainly think about over the next week. That was all on that, Madam Chair. Just to answer the administrator's question, uh, no, we had April town meeting and then we had a May election. Okay, it yes. was uh, 
way back when, when the elections used to be held in September or the beginning of October, end of September, beginning of October, when the annual town elections were. But then when the charter was changed, it moved it to uh, the May dates and the town meetings were always April. And uh, and again, that was part of the argument about changing the, uh, the town meeting date was, you know, recommendations made by the Board of Selectmen uh, on a budget. And then all of a sudden, you have a change in the board. You could have two members change in any one year, and then you'd have a maybe a new recommendation for a June town meeting. But we got over that. So, yeah. so previously we just had the uh, elections in May, and the town meetings were in April. Okay, thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Again, no action required this evening, Madam Chair. Just sort of putting out there the things that maybe we should think about between now and the next meeting. Just trying to make sure while you're here and we're talking about it that the members have any if they have any questions they can ask of it and we can revisit it as well but mr walner any questions mr schultz mr mrs gonzalez no nope. all set okay one other quick question maybe the administrator could assist us in relation to our madam chair maybe you could too in relation to the uh, ability for communities to go to a 112 budget should this pandemic thing protract itself and we are able to have a, a town meeting. Uh, you might want to explain uh, to us and the public as to you know how that might work. Madam Chair, do you want to take that? Or would you like me to? Sure. Well, there are provisions in the special legislation that was enacted that would permit us to go to a 112 budget and permit us to utilize uh, free cash and uh, un unexpended fund balances in our enterprise and revenue funds for purposes of um, expenditures, the necessity of that, that I think we'd have to talk to our finance director on. Um, and, um, they, but if we, if we aren't able to adopt a budget on or before the 30th, we are permitted now based upon the special legislation to go to that 112 with a notification to the director of accounts at the division uh, the Department of Revenue. And I don't know if there's anything else. We have the finance director. Um, if there's anything else you'd like to add to that. Uh, no, I mean, you summed it up um, for us. And, you know, I think uh, we will just have to wait and see what happens. Um, you know, currently we have good reserves um, and a good amount of free cash still available. So, um, you know, we're not in a bad situation if, if we have to go that route. Um, Mr. Gilberto, anything else to add to that? Um, no, no, not at this time. Questions, comments. The goal would clearly be not to have to go to a 112, and the goal would be to have to, you know, get the. We've already been through all our budget hearings, and we have to have the work of uh, putting a fine, fine, uh, fine point on things and moving forward. And the goal would be to get a budget enacted and adopted on or before June 30th. And I think that, you know, we're all mindful of and working towards that goal, oh, continuing to work toward that goal. All right, so with no other hands raised and no vote required on that, let's move to the next order of business, which is, well, actually, we didn't actually review the town meeting articles. And I, I know it's in, it was in the packet, um, did, and is there any question with regard to that? It really has it has remained the same. Um, Correct. It's not changed at this point, and honestly, not much has happened with it since our last meeting. Okay, so we'll move on to agenda item number ten, which is to review the draft open space and recreation plan. And I know that um, uh, some of the our members worked worked on that and served on the committee. And Mr. Gilbert, if you want to begin, and then we'll. Uh, pass pass this off to Mrs. Gonzalez to discuss too if she'd like to and I sure. think we probably have our planner. She is on. That's right. The planner is on. Um, Leanne, I don't know if you wanted to give an introduction and then have uh, Danielle just kind of go through the brief presentation she has. Sure. Um, so this is a committee um, to update our open space and conservation. Um, in order 
to be able to get grants um, that we'd like to apply for. Um, without this being updated, we wouldn't be able to have that. So we've been we've had several meetings and um, made a lot of progress. If you look in your packet, there's a, a map, um, an action plan map, and it's probably something that would explain, you know, a lot of the things that we've discussed and and met and talked about, the things that we feel are needed to be updated and um, looked at. Um, so if you look at those, there's a lot of um, a lot of open space areas in town that have no access. It's kind of the one of our biggest things that we've talked about that we have some great areas that um, people would like to access, but they can't. Um, so that's something that we'd like to improve maps and trails and, and signage and parking. And, you know, there's a lot, um, but we've mapped it all out so that if in the future, we'd like to get some grant money and get some help to get some of those things done. It's here and it, and, um, it would get approved. So I'm sure Danielle has a lot to say about this too. Sure. Um, so is it okay for me to share, uh, do share screen so I can put the presentation up? Oh, it is. We, is it security? Can I do that? You can, but I need to change the security setting because we were just concerned about people zoom bombing us. I heard about that. Zoom <laughs> bombed. <laughs> Okay, see if that works for you now, Danielle. Yes. Um, so I think I'll just choose this. Okay. Um, nice. Okay, see if that okay. works for you now, Danielle. Nice. All right. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I'll be giving you an update on the town's open space and recreation plan. The goal of this presentation is to involve the select board in the planning process for the OSRP update. Um, and we, uh, just, I wanted to provide some background about OSRPs, our process so far, and the role of the select board in developing and implementing the OSRP. And based on that background, I'm hoping just to gather some feedback from the select board on the draft OSRP. Um, and this is just a brief overview of what I will cover. Um, the purpose of an OSRP is to assess what the town has in terms of open space, conservation lands, and recreation facilities. Um, it encourages us to think about the potential of these properties for improvement and what they need for maintenance and to stay protected. Open space in terms of an OSRP includes conservation properties, recreation facilities, um, and undeveloped land with conservation or recreation potential. Um, and for example, it includes forested land and agricultural land, as well as passive recreation properties, with trails, and active recreation properties, with playgrounds, and sports fields. Um, the plan will discuss care and ownership of our resources, as well as our open space and recreation needs, uh, such as additional facilities or lands that would help meet those needs, and what steps we might take to address that over the next seven years. Maintaining an up-to-date plan is also a requirement, as Ms. Gonzalez said, um, for receiving state grants for parks, conservation lands, and other open space. MAPC has been hired by the town uh, to provide technical assistance and lead the preparation of the plan. The OSRP committee, uh, composed of local leaders, guides the process. Uh, the process was designed to proactively reach out to the community, um, in, including especially underrepresented residents, to be responsive uh, to the needs of the community. And the committee includes uh, Maureen Stevens, Director of Parks and Recreation Department, Marty Tilton, Parks Director, myself, Danielle McKnight, Town Planner, um, Ms. Gonzalez, as our select board member, Rita Mullen uh, from the re uh, representing the Recreation Committee, Randy Mason representing the Conservation Commission, and Phil Hertz uh, representing the Land Utilization Committee. With outreach to community groups and at major community events, including the turkey trot, the tree lighting, and light up Main Street, a substantial portion of residents have um, been made aware of the process, and over 500 have taken the survey, which represents more than one in 30 residents. This is a list of the basic contents of the plan, which I can speak to in a little bit more detail um, a little later in the presentation. This 
And so far, um, our process has included a kickoff meeting in November, drafting and circulating a resident survey from November through the end of December, a public meeting, analysis of feedback from the survey and writing of the, of the draft plan. The draft plan is currently being reviewed um, by the town and um, OSRP committee members. Um, in February, we reached out to the conservation and LUC uh, for feedback and making and for making revisions. Um, due to the necessary changes in our meeting schedules in recent weeks, um, we're presenting to you now instead of earlier in March. Um, we had planned to present to the select board and the CPC earlier in March, but of course had to change that plan. Um, we do plan to present to the CPC later this month. And the board, um, any feedback we receive from um, the select board and CPC can take place in between submittal of the draft plan and finalizing the plan. Um, so we actually elected to submit the first draft of the plan in March just to ensure that the town remains eligible to apply for grants. Um, we have um, plenty of time to make changes based on feedback that we receive. Um, and now just a few words about the draft OSRP. Um, it contains this map of our open space inventory, uh, which identifies all the open space in town, including conservation land, recreation facilities, private properties with chapter 61 status and um, other open space um, owned by other towns. Um, it also discusses the examples of the different types of our most important open spaces in town, including Ipswich River Park, um, for example, shown here, and discusses their condition, ownership, access, and potential. Um, also highlights Benevento Memorial Field, um, Arnold Parker, DCR property located in multiple towns. Um, so it really tries to span the full range of all of our open spaces, whether or not owned by the town. Um, this shows some of the areas around Swan Pond, which are partially town owned, partially owned by the town of Danvers for water protection and partially in private ownership. Um, after the introduction and plan summary, this draft uh, will contain three sections, um, including community setting, which is uh, demographics, regional context, um, history, local development regulations. Um, then we move on to number four, which is environmental in inventory, which discusses our water resources, habitat resources, climate change impacts, et cetera. Um, uh, chapter five is lands of interest, which is a discussion of existing open space and land under threat of development, a detailed inventory of all the open space in town, including private and public lands, parks, and conservation properties, a list of the rec criteria for prioritizing land to uh, protect or develop into parks. Um, then the community vision chapter is based on the public outreach that we've received. Um, chapter seven, analysis of needs, is a discussion of what's needed in terms of land protection and recreation facilities, uh, review of park use and maintenance, um, findings from the community survey. Um, and then we have a goals and objectives section, um, then moving on to the chapter nine, which is a seven year action plan, which are the actions to achieve those objectives. And also um, that section assigns responsible parties in a time frame. And that's actually something I'm gonna ask you to um, take a little time to pay attention to. If you are ready to give feedback on that tonight, that's fine. But if you want more time on that, um, because the select board is one of the entities that um, is assigned um, roles in this action plan. Um, so for the 2020 goals, um, just to kind of, ooh. oh, <laughs> oh, I see what happened here. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to do it that way. Um, okay, these, these are the 2020 uh, goals. Um, if you want to take a moment uh, to kind of read through, these are the goals that have come out of the draft, um, you know, that draft plan that we have so far based on the feedback and the research that's been done. Um, provide a range of recreational opportunities for all, maintain high quality of recreational services for all residents, protect water resources um, to protect our water plates or sugar watershed, uh, protect, it, protect our natural features uh, for biological diversity, um, expanding and improving access to all of our open spaces and recreation facilities, um, providing universal access to facilities and programs, um, plan and coordinate protection of lands, um, manage town open space, um, while encouraging appropriate public use, uh, coordinate protection and management of um, our recreation and natural resources um, within the multiple jurisdictions that there may be, including the state, and just to ensure adequate staffing resources and communication um, to implement our plan. 
Um, so this part just addresses, um, to, just to discuss um, the select board's role um, in the plan. Um, and just to kind of put, put this part into context, um, this is, um, just to kind of frame this, these are the sentiments that came through most clearly in the resident outreach portion of the plan. People really love our, our parks and our recreation facilities. Um, they're happy to take part in a survey. They're happy to give feedback. They're really eager to say how much they like it. Um, there are lots of suggestions for different kinds of things that we could improve and do, um, but people really um, you know, feel that our uh, parks are really well run and well maintained and have uh, lots of high praise for our parks and recreation department. Um, and certainly people are interested in protecting and preserving more open space in North Reading and, um, you know, certain types of improvements, you know, as they become possible um, are also of interest. Um, so the seven year action plan, um, that should be something that you've got in your packet for tonight. It's, it's an excerpt that's directly taken out of the end of the draft plan. Um, it's just, I've just pulled it out because it's a little bit easier to look at. It's still quite long. I don't know if I've had a chance to look through it yet. Um, there, this is a summary of the actions that had been designed, uh, had, had been assigned to the select board back in 2013 when we did our last open space plan. Um, some of this has been done, some of this has not been done. Um, that's fine. Um, the action plan from 2013 is a very, very long plan that, um, you know, names lots of things that were very ambitious that we wanted to do. Um, whatever we haven't done can easily be rolled into our, this next current plan, um, but at some point it would be great to get some feedback on um, whether you feel the select board's assigned roles are appropriate ones for the select board, whether you agree that they're priorities, and based on that feedback we'll make adjustments um, to the plan. Um, just in terms of the next steps, um, I, I should say just in terms of like the changes that have had to take place, as I mentioned, our, our schedule was, was changed a bit due to um, all the uh, changes due to the virus. Um, oh, oh. Okay. I, I should say just in terms um, of the changes that have had to take place, as I mentioned, our, our schedule was changed no, no. um, due to um, all the so, uh, changes due to the virus. So, let's see. Um, at this stage, um, the first draft of the OSRP, as I mentioned, has been submitted to the state, um, which makes us eligible to apply for state uh, grant funds for parks. Um, however, uh, we're not able to actually receive those funds or use them until the plan is finalized. So our target for that is June. So um, any feedback that we receive um, between now and final submission of the plan in June um, can be you know, incorporated into the plan. Um, We've just recently made the full draft plan available to the public um, and to our boards on our website. Um, public engagement is a required part of the plan. And as I mentioned earlier, we had a survey with a great response rate and one public meeting. We'd originally planned to have information available at the town hall as well as on you know, the town website and social media to complete the last portion of our public engagement, but we, we needed to modify that. Um, so MAPC is helping us by creating an online self-guided virtual town hall. Um, and an information resource that the public can access from home at their leisure over a period of a couple of weeks. Um, they can leave questions and comments. They don't have to commit to a single evening presentation. They can explore the information in a lot of detail or very little detail, whatever they choose. Um, so we're going to be um, doing that instead of the um, in-person uh, you know, ability for people to come into the town hall and, and view the information. Um, we expect to receive comments from the state also, and we're going to be making those changes before the plan is finalized. And during this process, we'll also be requesting endorsement letters from the select board and the CPC, um, which is also a required part of the plan. Other boards and commissions are requested to send letters too, but they're not required um, as the select board and CPC is required to do. Um, if you were ready to sign off in the endorsement letter tonight, that's fine. I have a draft of it, but um, you know, if not, if there needs to be more time for review. That's perfectly fine. We would just want to target this to happen by the end of June. Um, for the discussion part of the presentation, I can I can answer any questions you may have. Um, I did want to draw your attention too to that seven year action plan, um, which you know at some point, if if tonight, great. If not tonight, um, we would be looking for some some feedback on that. So with that I wanted to see if there were any questions. Thank you, um, Mrs. McNett. I know that the the letter that you drafted is our commitment towards those goals. I'm not sure that every member, I certainly haven't had an opportunity to read through it, and um, but 
But if there are any members that have and have questions while you're here, that would be great. Anybody have questions? Mr. O'Leary? Mr. Sorry, Mr. O'Leary, you good? But for the moment. Oh, there you go. Okay. For the moment. All right. Mr. Walner? I'm also good for the moment, looking forward to um, maybe where we could really drill into what the objectives are and discuss that more yeah. at a time when it's convenient to do so. It's great. Um, it's a pretty comprehensive. Correct. Yeah. That'd be good. Uh, Mr. Schultz? All good. Okay. Mrs. I got to unmute myself first. No, all good. And thank you for the presentation. Oh. Mrs. Gonzalez? Danielle, I didn't notice. Um, Am I on? Thank you for the presentation. Yes. Okay. Um, I didn't notice uh, the historical piece in there at all. Am I missing that? The, the properties are included in the inventory and in the map. Um, and I believe there is some discussion of that in the body of the report, but let me find it and I can send you that part and then we can talk about whether it's covered properly. I just want to make sure that's in there. Sure. Okay. Okay. And I see no other hands and Mr. Gilbert. Oh, Mr. O'Leary. <laughs> Mr. O'Leary, on mute. On mute. Yeah, you go. Is the... Um, is the planning commission going to be talking about things such as the Community Preservation Act and recommending to the board that maybe we adopt it, which we haven't done in the past? And in addition to that, have you looked at, and I, I know it's mentioned where the 61A properties, uh, where the town could um, provide their option to buy to other nonprofits? That may assist, and, it, and again, have we had any outreach to, you know, say like the trustees of the reservations or any of those other nonprofits um, that may have an interest in some of our properties to assist us in maintaining these open spaces? So I don't know that it's come up yet as far as reaching out to other entities um, like the trustees of reservations, but I think that's a great idea. And I think what I'll do is I will ask our consultant to um, tell us what our options might be for that. I think that would be really helpful for there to be some discussion of that. Um, and then for your other question with regard to the Community Preservation Act, it's mentioned in the report as a possible as a possible mechanism for funding. Um, they don't spend a lot of time exploring it, I think because it hasn't yet really been brought forward in North Reading as far as I know, and I know people are very, very sensitive to tax burdens. So, um, I think my sense had always been that that might be a tough sell, but it's also a great source of money and the communities that have it are really doing some great stuff with it. So there's definitely a discussion of that as an option. I don't know that the CPC would necessarily be the ones to push it, but um, we can look at the action plan and under strategies for funding, we can look at whether the, if, if that's something that we might want to see move forward, then, we can, you know, figure out how to work it into the action plan, at least as something to explore. Yeah, it, it, to me, I mean, we've been able to utilize the Hillview as an enterprise to assist us, you know, in lieu of the Community Preservation Act. Uh, years ago, you know, I was an advocate for it, but again, it didn't, uh, didn't get a lot of legs underneath it because, again, people don't like uh, additional tax burdens placed upon it. But for those communities that have it, it really does provide a significant amount of revenue and options, you know, for providing for open space and affordable housing. Uh, that we don't necessarily have access to. So, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, whether it's 1%, 2%, and I don't know whether it's up to 5%, but whatever the, the, the number is, you know, I think it's something that we should probably be taking a look at. And in relation to other than nonprofits, you know, if you could talk to the consultants and take a look at the, the parcels that we own that would be um, maybe likely candidates, you know, maybe it would be an Eisenhower Pond Park or something, which is, it hasn't been developed yet, Okay. Um, but is it something that we could you know, parlay property that we have to pass off to another nonprofit to assist us in, in the, the development of it? But, sure. uh, but okay. I think it's, I think, you know, this is very comprehensive. There's a lot of material that's covered here, a lot of areas that are covered in the community. And again, as we talk and move forward, whether it be Seven Acres Poultry Farm or there's going to be other 61A properties that I think 
market, I forecast within the next five years are going to become available to the town. Whether we have the resources to do it is another question. Um, and I think this is a, a great step in the right direction. I think it's our target. Uh, I think we should take a look at uh, any funding mechanisms that may come available to us. And again, if we need to propose the town meeting to adopt the Community Preservation Act or the ballot, you know, maybe we should do it. Let the people decide because everybody seems to be on board with preserving open space. But when it comes time to pony up and get the money there, um, it, it's a difficult question uh, to address. So, you know, if we have a, a pool of funds available to act quickly, it makes sense. But I applaud your efforts. I think this is a terrific uh, step in the right direction, and I look forward to uh, digesting it a little bit more. Mr. Walner. Uh, yeah, I should have asked this before. So, Danielle, um, I'm asking for like a focus session. When can you imagine us doing that? Because I did read over the 160 pages today and the town should be aware. It's an extensive <laughs> study. I'm not sure if it's on the website yet or not, um, but it is an extensive study. It's, it has a lot of information, but when would you actually imagine us as the board being able to hear more about this? Because I don't want to let this just slide away. Well, whenever you're able to, um, the target would really be, so our original timeline for this was um, finalizing this whole thing by the end of June. Um, and we'd really like to keep to that just in case a funding opportunity should arise. We really want to make sure the town can take advantage of it. So sticking to our schedule, um, having that focus discussion anytime between now and sometime in early June, just so that there's enough time to make any necessary edits would be ideal. Um, you know, that would that would really be that would be best so that we don't slip in our final submission of the plan. So, so I guess I would then ask, um, you know, uh, Kate and Michael, does it look like we have that opportunity to give this some serious attention? Uh, I don't, I don't think there was any issue of us not giving it serious attention. It's being introduced to us today and not all of us have had the opportunity today to read through it, nor have there been opportunities for the public to read through it. And I'd like to see some feedback on the public comment. We don't have a uh, typical means of, um, you know, hearing this publicly with public comment right now. I mean, we could uh, set that up, but I'm not at a position in this immediate moment to tell you when that is. And they're also going to be receiving revisions to this. And so at some point, we're also going to be looking at other input, um, as Ms. McKnight explained, um, that potentially revises this. So I, I know that there are a lot of recommendations for the board to take on. And I think it behooves us to give ourselves some time to read through it, absorb it, understand it, see what members of the public have for input as well, and, and then set it up. I, I would assume we're gonna have more presentation or more questions for Danielle at another one of our select board meetings coming up. Do, is that what you think, Danielle? So what is it, what exactly? Sure, what I was envisioning was uh, maybe one more session after people have had a chance to, you know, first hear this introduction tonight, um, had a chance to spend a little bit more time looking at the plan, um, thinking about the plan. Um, we're going to be opening up the virtual open house online, which I'll send out a link about um, pretty soon. Um, that'll be ready, um, I would think maybe even later this week. So once people have had a chance to, you know, read through and digest, um, and even even if you don't have the time to read through the entire plan, which is very big, um, at least focusing on that action plan, which really are just the recommendations and who's responsible for what. I mean, that would really be a great point to focus on if, if you're not able to focus on the rest of the plan. But 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 sure, I'm happy to come back and have a more focused discussion once that can happen. Mm. And I think in terms of the other, rec, you know, considerations or, you know, I know you were tracking the 2013 plan and all of the things that the select board was targeted to achieve, including consideration of like what Mr. O'Leary was saying about the, the CPC funding or the CPC ordinance and, and act, adopting that legislation. I think those are all also things that we need to draw in our fiscal officers on, given the state of COVID-19 and the state of reduced revenues and the likelihood of reduced uh, funding that we're going to be seeing, not just in our city, but from the state and the government. 
that we really need to consider all of these things when we're talking about diverting portions of tax revenue to, to this endeavor. But it also might be like Mr. O'Leary said, a great use of those funds and open up the potential for, for us to get more matching funds that we can then designate specifically to the preservation of the open spaces that we have or we're anticipating acquiring, but it also re involves a more comprehensive financial review of those, that legislation for us, especially in this, in this time. And I can probably conceive of why it was maybe put to the wayside back in 2013, having two overrides for the school building project that the town was handling and probably not wanting to consider anything else tax related at that point. Um, but I think it would be interesting for you when you raise that point of what was taken on, what was agreed to be taken on in 2013. Did we arrive at any of those goals and did we let some of those goals back? That would be nice to see that comparison or discuss that comparison too. Sure. Um, but I'm talking too much. I want to get every member's opportunity. So Mr. Schultz, anything more, Mr. Schultz? No, I think we've covered it very thoroughly, yeah. All right. Mr. O'Leary, are you all set? I'm sorry. Mr. Walner, are you all set? I also do that. All set, Mr. Walna. Okay. Miss Mrs. Gonzalez. I'm all set. Okay. Thank you very much, Danielle. As usual, excellent job. Very, very specific and direct. And we are looking forward to having you back and giving you a little bit more of a block of time when we're able to kind of get our questions ready for you and get our areas of inquiry ready for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, now we're on to um, agenda item number 11, which is the waste, the water and waste water update. And we, Mr. Gilberto, are you still with us? I am with you. Yep. And, and okay, great. the water and wastewater update. And I know the water superintendent is on um, the DPW director with us as well. Okay. Mark, just you tonight. Uh, I believe so. Yes. Okay. I, I thought maybe we would just give a, a quick status update with regard to the water and wastewater items. And really just, I would suggest you or ask if we could keep it brief. I mean, there is some encouraging news. Um, it does lead into the, um, the the next item, which I'm I'm happy to explain a bit further, uh, or, or you certainly can explain as well, Mark. Okay, sure. So uh, I believe we all know that the final environmental impact report was submitted to the state in early February. They're in the process of reviewing that. Um, so things are moving forward on that that front. Simultaneously, that starts the interbasin transfer review where we're asking for additional water from the, the Merrimack River Basin through Andover. So both of those are kind of proceeding along. Um, we've received some comments back from the different state agencies that are involved in this. We've had some discussions with them uh, kind of on a parallel path. We've submitted um, both our formal final designs for the Central Street and Main Street booster pumping stations, as well as a temporary booster pumping station for um, the immediate need from Andover. Um, and as, as Mr. Gilberto explained, that leads into the next uh, next agenda item. Um, but I will tell you, we so we've had some discussions with the state. We don't see any huge hurdles. Um, there are a few, obviously, contentious issues we have with them, but um, I think we're all working together to try to resolve and come to a finalization so we can move forward with the projects. In terms of the wastewater, we've met with Andover again. Andover's asked us actually to take a step back and look at a couple different possible paths for, for getting the, wa excuse me, the wastewater through Andover. Uh, we had originally thought we'd go short a short distance into Andover and then go off to the left of Route 28 and run down through some of the uh, smaller neighborhoods of Andover. They've actually asked us to come up and take the wastewater on a path all the way up to Phillips and look at it from that perspective. They've also asked us to take a look at running it 
up Route 125 um, to Andover. So we're, we've engaged our consultants to kind of take a deeper look at, at both of those paths as well. So that's kind of where the wastewater is proceeding at this point as well. Okay, and questions, Mr. O'Leary? More, uh, more, yeah, more comment than question. Uh, um, first of all, I, I think the discussion that's taken place between our consultants and our administrative staff here and Mark and Michael and uh, Pat is uh, with Andover is, is very encouraging and heartening when it comes to wastewater. Um, I think uh, it's made great strides and it progressed a little further than I even anticipated, which is which is very good. So, you know, for their efforts, I applaud them and I appreciate uh, Andover's willingness to uh, engage us and ask us to look at other alternatives, you know, as opposed to trying to slow us down. They actually, uh, it seems somewhat encouraging. So that's very good in relation to wastewater. In relation to the water, uh, again, making a tremendous progress in relation to uh, uh, getting the location secured on Main Street and the temporary uh, solution to our problem in relation to uh, the west side station having to be shut down and addressing that situation. So things are progressing very well. And uh, again, uh, despite all that's going on and everybody having to do things, telecommuting and all the rest, um, they're, they're doing a terrific job of, uh, of moving the moving the projects forward. So again, I appreciate all the effort that's being put into it and the progress that's being made. And I also appreciate the state's uh, input and their um, recognition of uh, our timelines and working with us uh, to address our concerns. They've made their concerns and issues uh, known and we've been able to address them and they've been responsive. So that's uh, it's very good, all heartening. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner, questions, comments? I just, I just gonna ask like, why were they asking for you to consider alternative routes for the pipe, I guess, I, I, you know, and is there any impact on us because they asked for that? So there's a, it is a little bit of a time delay. It's a little bit of a step back for our consultants to go in. You know, if we had proposed a path and they said, oh, yeah, that's the we, we agree that's the best path. They obviously understand their system better than we do. Um, so we were making some assumptions that may have looked good on paper to us, but maybe in their actual experience of their system, they had some different thoughts about that. I think the Route 125 corridor is appealing to them because it doesn't impact them very much. It's not, you're not going into one of their residential neighborhoods and digging up a street. You're basically dealing with a state highway. So I think that's why they they kind of asked us to do that. It has the minimal impact on Andover. Um, they could have other other needs out there too that they're looking to help, you know, solve with one time putting the shovel in the ground. So going up Main Street might've worked better for them. It's something our consultants not knowing their system as well didn't understand. So we're taking a, just taking a step back to look at that. It, it, it you know, it will cost us a little more in time, but we've pulled the wastewater portion out of the FEIR. So that's not as time sensitive right now. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Schultz. No, I believe it's it's been pretty covered. We are making a lot of progress. We had a meeting again, uh, I think it was a few weeks ago now, on the issue, on various issues with the water and wastewater, and we're still moving in the right direction. I guess it's the best I can say. No, I believe it's, it's been pretty covered. We are Mrs. Gonzalez, any questions? Does that have any effect on the Los Dobos? Um, we're still moving in the right direction. Issue. Does that change that? So, so what, what you've heard from Mark is an update on the, what I'll call the, the long-term permitting process that we're in um, with regard to the FEIR. So the Dos Lobos location is the site that we'll be using for the permanent water chlorination facility. Um, I think as we've discussed, we've been looking at the need for a temporary water chlorination facility, which we can provide the update on uh, under the next agenda item. Okay, so that doesn't matter. That doesn't change that. No, we're still we're, we're still looking to, to use the the Dos Lobos location for the permanent spot. Um, I spoke with Mr. Dimitri, the property owner, this evening about it, um, and it very much is in in the in the queue. I think we're we're looking and we're hoping that we'll be able to expedite that faster than it normally would have gone, because we have an opportunity to take advantage of lower traffic volume in the parking garage. There, there is, you know, there is still some work to be done on that, and we're trying to, to move it forward, all while keeping our eye on the ball 
for this season for which we need to get that temporary chlorination facility up and running as soon as possible. Okay. No other questions, no other hands. Um, let's move on to the next order of business too, which is the uh, consent order. Yes. Um, the so, potable water. And it was in the packet and um, I don't, uh, Mr. Clark just mentioned this, but why don't you, if you don't mind explaining to the members what this is all about. So, so this document is, I think, and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but th this document is, you know, often a document that a community would be reluctant or concerned to see placed before it from Mass DEP. And it reads as such as well with mention of fines in it, et cetera. But in reality, what this document is, is a tool, a short-term tool that the State Department of Environmental Protection offered to us as a means to allow us to buy more water from Andover while we're going through the process of getting the long-term permitting in place to buy all of our water from Andover. And so, so let me ask you a question on that then. Well, I'm gonna stop you right there. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but are you su suggesting that DEP is suggesting we're not going to get permitted to be doing that, which was on a track already if we don't enter this consent order? No, no, I've never heard them say that they would not give us the permitting. I think the challenge is that there is a there are statutory timelines with that permitting and it would not be in place for the high water use season that is probably some four to six weeks away. And so they offered this as a temporary bridge for us while we go through that process to get the permanent permitting in place. It would not be in place for the high water use season that is probably some four to six weeks away. And so they this as okay, why don't you go over what the terms and conditions of it are then? The, the major terms and conditions that are going to impact us. It is, excuse me, Madam Chair, but this is a, is a direct a direct correlation with the uh, level of contaminants at one of our well sites. So we had to react to it. Is that correct, Mark? Right. So I believe at one meeting, we used the term emergency declaration, which was one avenue we could have gone through with the state where they basically could have come in, issued us a six month uh, waiver on our interbasin transfer permit volume. But it would have brought with it a bunch of significant conditions, especially relative to outdoor watering. They basically would have uh, required us to implement a full outdoor water ban immediately upon uh, the emergency declaration being issued. This administrative consent order, we sat down and talked with DEP. This was a different avenue that they felt they had two ways to do the same thing. And this this is uh, offers a little bit more flexibility on their end, as well as giving the town a little bit less drastic uh, implementation of conservation measures. So this basically allows us, it, it, the wording is, it's fairly broad in this, that it allows us to immediately draw our what will be our permitted volume of 3 million gallons a day instead of the million and a half gallons a day. So we can draw up to 3 million gallons a day. Now that we don't use 3 million gallons a day in any day at this time. So that was a, a 99 year projected volume with build out with sewer in North Reading. So we can draw up to 3 million gallons a day. But to make the, we're not allowed to draw that yet because we don't have the infrastructure in place. This is all the information that you've presented to us previously. So we're working on getting the infrastructure in place that doesn't exist to be able to draw up to that. But that's what all this permitting process is about. And with regard to West Elm, it was already taken offline and that's what the presentation to us was recently. And we aren't drawing from that. So the, the need for a consent order, I'm completely puzzled by it still, even with the explanation. So at, so at some point this summer with our West Village water treatment plant being offline, we're going to be in a straight where we're either going to have to implement very stringent water restrictions or find some other source of water. The obvious other source of water is the ability to draw more water from Andover. So while, while we're not looking to take 3 million gallons a day, we are looking to for this summer and until we get our permanent stations, we're looking to take more than a million and a half gallons a day. And that's basically the, ve this is basically the vehicle on a paper thing to allow us to do that. We do have the ability to draw more water physically. 
this is the the regulatory mechanism for that so in other words this is in lieu of them moving forward with permitting that for us so they are permitting we submitted their permitting they they have statutory guidelines on how long it takes them to review and issue comments and, and issue the final permit we're, we're pushing them to, to expedite that on their fastest possible path but that's not going to happen before our water demands increase in in may or june this year questions comments mr schultz or no mr did you have a hand up mr schultz no mr o'leary i i just see this as a um, as an effort on the part of the state to assist us in bridging the gap and addressing a couple of issues. One is our FEIR, the whole permitting process and the interbasin transfer. They recognize they're on board, and but it's going to run the necessary timeline, which goes beyond the timeline that we have to come into compliance with in relation to our emergency, the emergency declaration that we were facing. So this is in lieu of the emergency declaration and in the recognition that, you know, we have an alternative source of of water, which is Andover, which is extremely viable, and we're look, we've already entered into a 99-year agreement. So to me, this is just like a, a bridging the gap time frame without all the uh, imposition of stringent requirements that could be placed in the town if they went the other route. So I think this is a, a good opportunity, and, a, and again, I applaud uh, everybody's efforts to, to come to the table and, and be reasonable about it, and I think the state's been very reasonable. And again, this is... Uh, this is the mechanism by which they could facilitate it most expeditiously and uh, meet our needs and help us bridge the timeline from when we get the, the final permitting. This is the mechanism by which they could facilitate it. Mr. Um, Mr. Wal Mr. O'Leary, all set? All set. Mr. Walner? I'm all set, thank questions, you. Questions, comments? Okay. Mr. Schultz, questions, comments? Mrs. Gonzalez? I'm all set. Okay, and, and again, my my view of it doesn't really change. That if if we were in process and we would be we had these permitting in process, I don't see how this comes even into remotely into into play with them reviewing the request for us and us getting infrastructure set up to be able to draw, and then somehow this is you know wedged into that process as though we need this and it's an immediate emergency for us. We won't be able to, to draw what we need to draw without the proper infrastructure. This is all these moving pieces that we've been targeting and discussing and going over for the past several months to increase the increase the, the number of gallons per day that we're drawing from. We had to have all these pieces in order and we weren't gonna have, we weren't gonna maintain and keep these other pieces going right now. So to enter into this consent decree in in my opinion and especially given the language doesn't seem like it's uh, a, a friendly sort of bridge it it seems like it puts burdens upon us for something that actually isn't even a regulation yet and it was our own testing of it and our own discovery of it that led us to reporting of it and it's still within the regulatory limits because the proposed limits aren't even implemented yet. So um, still not understanding why this is somehow wedged into that process of us getting our permitting in, in, in place. Madam Chair, if I might just ask Mark, if, if we don't agree to this, what's the state reaction gonna be and what, what, what could occur for the town of North Reading? So if we don't agree to this, because we've tested, because we have tested, and I agree it was voluntary on our part, but because we have tested above the proposed limit, we're not able to restart those wells, those West Village wells at this time. So we're going to have to adopt fairly stringent water restrictions for the upcoming watering season. And what's the deadline for them to review the permitting that we've applied for, or we've submitted. It's completed, it's in, it's under review. How long is it going to take them? 
so there, there are two, two steps to it as we've gone through in the past. There's the, the uh, FEIR review, which is well underway. The comments are coming back on that. We should have comments back from that. And then we're going to have to respond to those comments. So that's a couple of month period. The other thing that's kind of taken a parallel path is the interbasin transfer increase in the permit volume we have. They're not, I don't know that they're required to start that until the FEIR is finished, but they're in the, I just received something today saying it was basically a, a notice saying they've received our Interbasin Transfer Act increase request. The state now has to schedule two public hearings on that, one in the Merrimack Basin, one in the Ipswich River Basin, and then they have to hold the third public hearing themselves, and then 90 days after that. So it's probably sometime in the October timeframe that we're going to have that uh, that interbasin transfer permit. I'm not going to argue with you that, you know, this is all a paper thing and, and it seems to be, you know, regulatory. It is. I think the state is working as as best as they can within their limitations. Now, you know, we're not the only situation they're dealing with and they can't come out and just grant blanket waivers to North Reading because then Middleton or Wilmington or whoever the next person down the pipe is, is going to point, point to how the state dealt with us. So I hate to say it, but it, you know, it's almost, it is what it is at this point. Um, it's not, it's not as onerous as it could have been. I think they've tried to work with us to make it as soft in terms of the terms on North Reading as it could be at this time. Any other members have any questions or comments? Mrs. Gonzalez, are you all set? I am. Okay. Just, again, Madam Chair, I just think it's important to, uh, to understand we've got this time period, a six, seven month time period where uh, we're faced with this dilemma and this is what bridges the gap for us. And again, hopefully come November, you know, we're in far better shape and have more permanence. Uh, so this basically, and I know there's been an awful lot of discussion and even pushback on our part on some of the uh, proposals that were put forth and the discussions that were had. Uh, and they've relaxed those uh, concerns and addressed the concerns that we've had and continue to address them. Uh, again, I just think this is the best solution for the time frame we're in in order to get this over this cusp period, you know, to the October, November timeframe. But, you know, otherwise we're facing uh, much more severe uh, restrictions as to what can and can't be done in our community unnecessarily. Any other questions or comments? I don't see any other hands. Mr. Gilberto, any other hands or comments? No? All right, so this is up of, I believe there is a vote in the packet on this. There is a motion, that's correct. A motion, excuse me. Mrs. Gonzalez, do you have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to approve Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection Administrative Consent Order and authorize the town administrator to sign. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Schultz. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And I vote no. The motion carries. Four in favor, one opposed. Yep. We are on to next order of business, which is approval not required plan for map 78 parcels 17 23 Riverside Drive uh, vote to authorize the chair to sign Mr. Gilberto thank you uh, madam chair so this is very similar to the property that we dealt with out on uh, Burroughs Road a couple of months ago um, it's a property Located on Riverside Drive, uh, we were approached by um, the owner, uh, Stephen Carrero, um, relative to his desire to buy all or a portion of the property. And the feedback that we provided to him was to work with a um, to work with an engineer to try to come up with a plan that carved out the portion of the property he was interested in buying 
Um, he has done that, and the plan was uh, in the packet. Um, I believe it is on page 97 of the main packet. And you can see his home is the number 25. Um, the property that we own is uh, now shown being divided into two lots with 30 feet of frontage each, lot 17A and lot 17B. Um, I believe that, I know that Mr. Carrero is interested in purchasing lot 17B. Um, I've heard that the property owner at the property next to that lot may be interested in, own, in purchasing um, lot 17A. Um, the motion that we've put before is to authorize the chair to sign the A&R application to the Planning Commission. And once that occurs, it'll go to the Planning Commission for action. And once approved, uh, the board will have the opportunity to put it out for auction. Uh, for okay, questions, Mr. O'Leary? No, thank you. I think we've talked about this set late. All right, Mr. Walner? I'm good, thank you. Okay. Mr. Schultz. No, nothing to add. Miss Mrs. Gonzalez. All set. Okay, so. And, uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I, I see somebody with the initials SC on there. I don't know if that's Mr. Carrero, and if it is, if he wants to add anything. Okay, so. I don't see any hands up. Do you see okay. no comment? Okay. All right. See, no further comment. Do I have a motion? Mrs. Gonzalez. Madam Chair, I move to authorize the chair to sign the approval not required application for 23 Riverside Drive, map 78, parcel 17. Second. I have a motion by Mrs. Gonzalez and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Schultz. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And I vote aye. So the motion carries unanimously. Next order of business is town administrator's report. That's correct, Madam Chair. Uh, just two, verb two items uh, verbally for this evening. The first is that the DPW Yard Waste Drop-Off Center opened for the season last Monday, March 30th. Right now, it is open only during um, DPW work days from 8 a.m. until 3 p.m. We also have a curbside yard waste pickup scheduled for this coming Saturday morning, and items should be curbside by 6.30 a.m. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, old and new business, right? Are we up to old and new business now? Thank goodness. Yes, Mr. O'Leary. I just want to, uh, again, uh, thank the Easter Bunny for uh, his presence around town and uh, adding some uh, pleasure and levity to what everybody's experiencing. And uh, it's a fine public service and look forward to you having stopped by my house next Sunday. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Walner. Um, I just wanted to comment that Mike Gilberto had put in the paper March 24th, a letter to the editor that I thought was really uh, heartfelt and I really appreciated it and proud to be on the same uh, team as you. So thank you, Michael, for that. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Der Schultz. Um, Michael, I think we have a, a special guest that actually stuck around North Reading for one more day. If you could bring him up for us. I think we can see him, right? Can everyone? You got to make him the main picture. Um, I, I thought we were being Zoom bombed. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see anything. So I think I'm... he needs to talk to be able to be brought up, or you yeah, got to. You, you may need to. <laughs> oh, I see him. <laughs> well, let me see if I can do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> There he is. Is. Yeah. He was all over North Ray in the last couple of days. I did hear reports that he was still around for one more day and they'll be back on Sunday to deliver the candy for the kids. But we want he's a hornet too. He, he wants some hornet stuff. But we want to thank him for all the joy he brought to the kids this weekend and also um, thank uh, Sean Delaney for reaching out to him to, to have him come to North Reading and for Michael Prisco for being the chauffeur of the Easter Bunny for two full days. So thanks a lot, EB. And we'll hopefully we'll see you on Sunday bringing all the candy to all the kids. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Easter Bunny. 
<laughs> okay, and Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, oh, I'm just gonna repeat just uh, how how amazing this town is um, with all the what everybody puts into you know just spreading some happiness and trying to make the best of a bad situation. Um, it's just great. That's all. Okay, thank you. And then to to continue on in that in that vein, I want to thank our town employees. I think it, these remote meetings highlight these people are still actively at work, uh, intensely working to keep our government running. Thank you to the town administrator, the finance director, the, the planner, to the water supervisor, to everybody that's joining us. These are people with children that they're taking care of, families, their kids are home. I also wanted to mention um, kudos to the school department for getting us up and running with some online training for our kids and get, keeping them engaged and active so we're not dealing with regressing in their education and moving them forward and, and uh, keeping them on keeping them on task. But all of these people that are here today and participating and helping us and continuing to be the face of the town for us in their, you know, online postings, letters to the editor. We really appreciate all the effort that you're doing under these circumstances. It's difficult enough for anyone, but juggling all of these things, especially in trying to work remote, com coming and going with everything that's happening. We really appreciate the effort. And also, of course, we want to thank our police and fire and uh, all of our um, public safety people and the DPW, our public safety people, and appreciate all the efforts that you're doing to keep everything running for us. And that's it from, from my, I see no other comment and I'm gonna go to, we have, we have to adjourn to, we have to take a vote on executive session next. So we're not done, but the rest of you can sign off. Madam Chair, I move to enter into executive session for the purpose of exemption three, collective bargaining, health insurance, and exemption six, real estate, 303 and 327 Main Street. Such discussion in open session will have a detrimental impact on the town and to admit the following, nobody. <laughs> um, Mr. Gilberto, who are we admitting? Madam Chair, uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Rourke, Finance Director, Robert Collins, Human Resources Director, Tony Mafio, IBG Consultant. Oh, wow. <laughs> we'll be joining us on a separate call, which I believe the board member should have a, an email link for. Okay. Can, you, second. can you repeat who that third person was? For Tony Mafio, IBG Consultant. Okay. So I have a motion by Mr. Gonzalez and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Schultz. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Aye. And we're only reconvening right for the purpose of adjourning after executive session's over. Correct. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.